Hi, everybody. This is literally a spectacular interview with Hannibal Taubes. And I just want to let you know, it's also three hours long. And the first hour is really an introduction. The talk we have is, is I think, is quite lively and entertaining, but it starts slow because there's a lot of information to cover to set up the conversation we eventually have and really, really just get going at the very end. Uh, but this is a model for how depth works. Uh, and feel free um, in the video to jump around, go to the end, go to the middle, go wherever you want. The, like, like I said, the first hour is, is an introduction. Oh. Hi, this is Scott Park Phillips, and I'm here interviewing Hannibal Tobbs, and <laughs> who's, who's giving me free, free reign to pronounce his name. And he is a, uh, a newbie historian who is one of the bright lights in the future of, of the study of, um, of whew, well, we'll get into what it is exactly in just a second. Uh, I, I have the chance to read a couple of his papers and he can write, which is phenomenal. Um, his, his, uh, his paper, particularly on perspective, uh, is really interesting perspective in murals uh, has a fantastic introduction for people if you're interested in in getting a sense of what the culture was that produced uh, in this case murals in the case of the article but in more generally it's the same culture that produced Chinese martial arts and that's why I wanted to interview him because he has collected an incredible amount of material on the visual culture and the spatial organization of Chinese villages in the north, and this is where uh, this is where our martial arts come from, and it anything that we could say about the origins of Chinese martial arts should be consistent with this visual culture and with this these ideas about space and time and uh, and what's important to people. Um, <clears throat> so the my first question uh, for you, Hannibal, is um, you 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 were studying. Uh, I also read your paper on on uh, the four forts in um, in uh, Amdo, a part of a part of Tibet, um, which is fascinating because of its multi ethnic character, particularly how many different types of armies and forces were negotiating for space there and uh, and and then you happened somehow to be wandering through north china and why don't you tell us about that uh that, that, well that, that, that's a long story and not one that makes that much sense uh, I've, I've been living on and off in different parts of north china uh since i was sort of a teenager actually um but um, I got interested in these fortresses uh, because I am a Google Maps fanatic. Um, and I would, um, and while procrastinating on nearly anything else in my life, uh, I would go and look at things on Google Maps and, and, and look at pictures of different places that I could be instead of wherever I happened to be at the time. And one of the things that I got interested in was um, uh, the Great Walls. So um, following the Great Walls, where do the Great Walls go? Um, there's all these sort of older lines that run off into the desert. There's some that shoot off into Russia. Um, the uh, <clears throat> There's some that are, you know, run along the, the edge of Tibet. There's um, all kinds of stuff. And, and then I got interested in the villages that, that sit at the foot of the Great Wall. Um, uh, and sort of uh, realizing that these villages are often really interesting and they um, are kind of part of the Great Wall system. So, you know, the Great Wall itself is, is <clears throat> um, you know, a single line, but behind the Great Wall, you have these kind of nested um, uh, defensive structures and which held people in them and, and people who had, you know, lives and cultures and relationships to this whole thing. So that, kind of structures a lot of what you read, both uh, in terms of what we're going to talk about today with these murals and with the um, that paper about about the Tibetan border and these kind of little groups of people who are kind of trying to survive 
uh, up in the mountains there and be between you know different forces <clears throat> all right start showing us some pictures all right yeah so i should preface that. <laughs> uh, yeah so uh hi everyone i'm hannibal uh the um uh i should preface this i don't know anything about kung fu i should just tell your listeners that right off the bat uh as i said i i did karate when i was a kid that uh uh, which which is not the same thing. And that's about all I know about it. <laughs> the um, I'm also uh, what I'm about to show you is very much a work in progress. So if anybody from my world, which is the um, the, the 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 arid halls of academia, uh, ends up watching this, um, this is a work in progress. I, I this is a bunch of stuff I've been collecting for a long time, but uh, it's not um in any kind of final state so a lot of what i'm going to tell you is this is a theory or here's something i found i think it means this but you know is that actually the case uh time will tell um awesome so uh yeah can i should i just take it away with the pictures or yeah go just talk about my project yeah okay so um let me pull up some photographs i'm, I'm just going to do a little historical spiel here can i is that, is that good? Yep. All right, cool. Um, okay, so, um, uh, all right, so, th so the easiest way to talk about what I'm interested in, uh, and also I think to articulate what I, well, the way what I'm interested in is maybe or maybe not relevant to uh, what you are interested in, uh, is to, to kind of explain um, uh, the, the 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 kind of root of my project. So so to, to to figure out what what my project is, you have to go back to this guy uh, whose name was Willem Rotters. Uh, so so this guy who um, uh, who's who's standing in in the center, um, who and so Willem Rotters was a Belgian missionary, a Belgian Catholic missionary in the early part of the twentieth century, uh, who was this. Um, Oh, here's another picture of him when he was young. He's standing in his his mission statement, uh, mi mi mission station north of Beijing, uh, and he um, got spent about ten years living out in the middle of nowhere in the North Chinese countryside. And um, he was a member of this uh, this organization called the CI CICM, which is the Con Concordatia Immaculati Cordis Mary. I think that's the right well, the co the Concordation of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, which uh, was this collection of these kind of brilliant Catholic intellectuals who would go out into the countryside in early 20th century North China and just kind of look for stuff. Um, and, and you have these, um, and they're totally forgotten today. I've been fascinated with these people for a long time because they wrote these brilliant books on which nobody reads anymore. Um, so you had in, in, in the Northwestern China, you had uh, Louis Schramm who wrote this incredible book on the, the Mongols and the, this kind of like village Taoism and Tibetan Buddhism uh, and, and their ritual life. Um, in, uh, in, in Mongolia, you had um, Serois who wrote these amazing studies of the Ming military. And um, actually the most famous one was a Mongolist whose name is escaping me. But anyways, there's this kind of generation of Catholic intellectuals in China uh, who, 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 whose whole kind of MO is just going out into the countryside and finding stuff. I, I might just stop because there may be people who are young watching this who have are looking for career pathways. And uh, these people all took copious notes. So and oftentimes the, the church somewhere is holding, you know, the church, say, in San Francisco is holding their collections. And the stuff is incredible. It's incredible. So somewhere, somewhere in Europe, hiding in some some library catalog or back file, are uh, Willem Rotter's notes. Uh, and if anybody ever finds those, give them to me because I would I would I would kill for them. Um, <clears throat> so if if you have them in your possession, I might be coming for you. <laughs> um, <clears throat> kung fu or no kung fu. Uh, yeah, these guys, these guys took notes and um, a lot of it's uh, in Belgium now, actually, but the, um, mm -hmm. anyway, um, <clears throat> so what, what and Willem Groters was a, uh, his, his father was, this is a long digression, but I'll, I'll show you why this is relevant. So uh, he, his family in Belgium uh, were involved in um, like a, a kind of a subfield of linguistics called uh, dialectology. So basically, um, 
which was pioneered in the Belgium and the Netherlands. So basically in Belgium and the Netherlands, you have, you know, every village speaks like a slightly different language, you know, it's French or Flemish or um, mm -hmm. Dutch. And so you had this generation of early 20th century linguists who would just go from village to village kind of mapping out linguistic tra traits and then produce these incredible kind of atlases of, um, uh, of you, know, you know, sort of linguistic dialectological, di dialect dialect anyway, dialect, uh, uh, flux across space. And, and Herter's great idea was you could do this with Chinese religion. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so what he spent his time doing is he spent his time, uh, so in the middle of the Sino-Japanese War in the 1940s, uh, you know, basically there are these armies passing to the left and to the right of his mission state, uh, his, his little kind of mission house uh, north of Beijing. And uh, he basically kind of bought a donkey and, and set out into the villages to collect, you know, religious traits, essentially. And he ended up going to something like four or 500 villages over the course of a couple of years uh, and writing down every single temple that was in the village. Um, and then writing about the iconography, which is to say the murals uh, that were painted on the walls and then the steles. So that you see in this picture, um, it's a temple building to the left. And then on the right, there's that kind of uh, big stone that's sticking up out of a, a pile of junk. I took this photo. Uh, you have an arrow, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, there it is. Um, yeah. So this thing's a stele. Um, basically, it's a. Uh, can I make this bigger? Let me, let me move you over here. Uh, you can see it's got it's got writing on it. Uh, you know, basically, it records. Um, uh, so this is from when? It's from sometime. It's from the late 18th century. So not that old. Uh, but it records the repair or creation or some kind of alteration to the temple. Um, so Hrotez went around collecting these things. Um, and eventually, um, here's another one. This is from a Genwu temple. Uh, you see this, there's this kind of stone on the right, sticking up on the right here, which has this, uh, this inscription. In this case, it's just a list. Or this is the back of the stele. It's just a list of all the people who donated to build this temple in the, in the 16th century. Um, and and Hrotez was going around collecting these things. Um, and uh, produce these kind of amazing studies, these kind of like geographical studies of you know every single village in a particular county and what temples they had, when those temples were built, uh, what were the different gods, what were the different iconographies of the gods, how did that kind of shift over space? Um, <clears throat> and and nobody's ever really done anything like this. In fact, the closest thing to this from that time period is uh, his missionary colleagues in in Qinghai with Louis Schramm uh, and these um, kind of Taoist Tibetan Buddhist villages on the on the Qinghai border. Um, so it's this amazing body of information that he collected and then published in a series of papers. And, and basically the thing that Hroteres couldn't explain was this, this graph. And he's aware that this is a problem in his data and he has no explanation. So this is, this is something I've put together from his data. So basically he was going around looking for these steles and he was trying to figure out what's the earliest date from which I can prove that, the, you know, a particular, the cult of a particular deity, let's say the perfected warrior general, um, do you have a preferred translation for Genwu, by the way? Uh, perfected warrior is good. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. True warrior, true soul. I don't know, whatever. Uh, we'll call him the perfected warrior. I like the perfected warrior. I think Genwu is fine, actually. Just go with Genwu. People, okay. people who've read my books know Genwu. All right, let's call him Genwu then. Uh, you know, so Rotes would say, okay, what's the earliest date from which I can establish? Uh, the cult of Genwu in this place. And, and basically, uh, you know, in all of his data, you know, he gets nothing, 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 nothing until about the year 1475, at which suddenly this whole landscape is just attested. Um, so kind of out of nowhere, some, everything's there. You know, he has all of the different cults, the deities in the places where they are now. There's a stele that says it was here. The only thing, the only kind of significant body of material that predates it, which I've, I've kind of cut out from this, is uh, he had all these kind of Dharani pillars. So there's these kind of octagonal Buddhist pillars with, um, uh, you know, like a Sanskrit um, uh, prayer or, or invocation to us usually to the Ushnisha Vijaya, which is that little kind of UFO that lives on the top of the Buddha's head, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> flies around, shoots beams, and yeah. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, that stuff is older. But you know, in terms of village temples, you know, essentially it seems like this whole landscape just appeared out of nowhere from about the year four fourteen seventy five, and was complete by the year fifteen fifty. Uh, and then, you know, afterwards, people continued to kind of, um, uh, 
you know, add stuff on, you know, repair temples, et cetera, et cetera, you know, sometimes add a new temple here and there. But, but basically, this is a landscape that is not attested outside of this single event that, that seemed to have happened in the, over the course of the early 16th century. Um, <clears throat> And Hrotters was kind of aware of this in his data. You know, he kind of mentions this a couple times, but he doesn't, he never could really work out why this might have been the case. Um, so he, he, he sort of avoids this problem in his papers. Uh, but if, if, you, if you plot out the stuff he's collected, you realize this is telling one story and we don't really know what that story is. Um, okay, so so that's one one half of it, right? So so what's going on with Crotter? And by the way, I can substantiate this with other collections of steles from other parts of this area, uh -huh. uh, where you know now um, I've collected a lot of these steles. Other Chinese scholars have collected far more than I have and published these collections. And basically, I think this is the right graph. And Crotter's was this is an accurate reflection of the data. In fact, Crotter's is much more accurate than anything we would have today because. He was able to collect. So it used to be if you had a temple, you'd have a giant bronze bell. Mm -hmm. uh, and that bell would have an inscription saying when it was cast. And usually the point where you cast the bell was roughly around the point where you built the temple. And we all know what happened to those bells. We all know what happened to those bells. They, yeah, they, they got melted down and turned into um, crappy iron ore for Mao's furnaces. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, <clears throat> all right. So then uh, moving on here. So, okay, this is what I've been doing. Uh, so in in uh, over the course of what I guess it was 2012 2013 I spent about a year in a single county of North China uh, which is which is called uh, Yuxian um, Yu County uh, which has this it's sort of I, I think is sort of the best preserved rural landscape anywhere north or west of Beijing um, it's just it has these hundreds and hundreds of kind of beautifully preserved uh, pre-revolution villages because basically everywhere else, you know, people have just been moved out of the old villages and then, or, you know, the old village has been demolished and they built a new village on top of it. But in Yu County, they take the people, they move them out of the old village and they move them into a new village, which is built next door. And so the old village is just kind of sitting there. So what I was doing over the course of this year, I went to something like 400 villages uh, myself. And so it turns out that these villages have walls around them. Uh, th this is wh why I was saying I got interested in this through thinking about the Great Wall, because if you look at these villages, you realize they're all walled. They had a mud wall that kind of went around and the walls have gates. Uh, so this is a picture of a, of a village gate in New County. And if you notice right up at the top here, there's this little kind of uh, square plaque right at the center, um, which is pretty high up there. I mean, it must be, I don't know, 15, 20 feet off the ground. Um, so uh, this is something that was also true in Hrotter's areas, the, the places that he studied, but he couldn't read these texts because he didn't have a ladder and he didn't have a camera with a zoom. And, you know, so zero. you got the donkey with a ladder? <laughs> I got, well, I got a camera with a zoom, which is even better. Oh, okay. um, I wish I'd had a donkey with a ladder. That would, would have been way cooler. Uh, instead, <laughs> I got a, 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 a camera with a mid-range kind of crappy zoom and... Um, a lot of blurry photographs, but, but basically, okay, if you look at these, okay, so this, this is a U County uh, fortress plaque, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it says the name of the village, uh, which is um, Tianzhou Tuan, so the, the um, uh, probably Tian and Zhao family village agglomeration and Ping Anbu, so the, the peaceful fort. Uh, and then it gives the names over here, the people who, who built the fortress, uh, mostly from the Pang family, but from some other families as well. Uh, and the names of the officers of the forts and the um, artisans who built it. Uh, and then over here, it gives the date, which is Jiajing Shijunian. So the, the 19th year of the Jiajing Emperor, which is, oh God, it's roughly in the 1540s, um, maybe 1530s. I might, might, I should know this, but I don't. Um, okay, so you have, uh, so basically what you know is, okay, um, this village, this village fortress was built in this place in the early 16th century. Uh, and if you uh, tabulate enough of those, um, you can graph out, okay, when were these fortresses built? And it turns out, surprise, surprise, that this, the graph of when these fortresses were built uh, matches Hroter's graph almost exactly, right? So before the year 1500, you have almost nothing. Uh, this is an old graph. I have more data now that I've collected uh -huh. since I mean, I should update this. It just takes a million years to do. Because I'm not publishing anything, but uh, I don't have to. Uh, the um, th this is something I made I don't know five or six years ago. I, I could I could deepen this data now. I was um, going to interrupt you for a second and just point out um, because these years, right? Um, this is the 
as the end here is the transition to the Wan Li era, where you have all the codification all, of all the major um, literary epics, uh, Journey to the West, uh, Journey to the East, uh, the Feng Shen Yan Yi, all, all of these, um, these, these uh, things are cataloged at the same point. So there's kind of a, you almost get this sense that, you know, well, we got the defenses set up. Okay, now let's codify the literature. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that stuff. I mean, this, I mean, what, essentially what, what this proves, right, <clears throat> is that the defenses happened at the same time as this kind of incredible religious change, um, right? And that's fascinating, right? Why the heck would that be the case, right? So what this essentially proves, and this, by the way, I should say is also the point uh, when um, uh, the great, the Ming Great Walls are being built. So the Mongols are coming over the border every year. The Ming are throwing up these massive walls across the north. So if you go up to, you know, Badaling or these places and you see the, the Great Wall, that's the Ming Great Wall, which was built almost exactly in this period. So what, you know, um, what this proves is, uh, I mean, first of all, so, uh, you know, um, ba basically, if you look at the Dalemi zoom in here, the, the, um, uh, why can I not zoom? I think we can see it, okay. Let me see it okay okay um <clears throat> uh right so before 1500 there's nothing uh you know and then almost everything is built between 15 1550 and let's say 1560 or even 1555 in you county you can have a really sort of precise cutoff date uh where you know this entire landscape is i'm pretty much um uh, every single building is just knocked down and rebuilt because uh, these fortresses are square, they're planned settlements, which means that, um, and every village has one, which means that by the end of this period, every single village had been knocked down, rebuilt from scratch in a new place with walls, square grid plan. Um, and, and then uh, further, the, the whole religious system comes into being right at this time. Uh, so the temples that exist are sort of around and on top of these walls are, are all showing up right in the same period. <clears throat> and that's fascinating, right? Why the heck would that be the case? So like what happened to this landscape? And as you said, this is this kind of storied moment in Ming history when all the, the you know, the great novels are being written. You have the, the Wokou pirates in the South. Uh, you have this, it's this kind of great age of, of, of Chinese uh, literature and, and drama, again, way further South than this little crappy co counties in the North. <clears throat> Um, but, There's an explosion uh, in commerce too. Explosion in commerce, explosion in printing, uh, and in the north you get this kind of profound religious change where you know suddenly not only are all the villages rebuilt, but they have a new religious system in them. Um, and so that is what I'm trying to explain, right? Um, so what is the connection between, and, and everything else that we talk about today is all kind of circling around that question where so why would it be the case that if you fortify your village, you need to build a new temple for it, right? So then that implies there, presumably there's some connection between let's say village militias and the cult of Genwu, which is one of the major things they were building here. Um, <clears throat> again, it's very hard to, the, everything else we talk about is gonna be like circling around the ways that we can and can't substantiate that. But this is the basic proof, right? So something is happening that connects these kind of like defensive military constructions with Chinese folk religion. Um, and I don't know what it is. I have some theory, I mean, I can, I'll show you some theories as to what it might've been, uh, but something is happening here. Just, just to uh, expand this, uh, this conversation very slightly. So this is uh, so just some other photos I have. This is just a map of the areas that I was surveying versus the areas surveys by, by Hroter. So Hroter is, is surveying up here. I know around Datong I'm survey, surveying down here. Beijing is over here. This is a map I put together. Um, um, show me that map again. Where, 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 is, uh, where is Stephen Jones' work? Yes, uh, Stephen Jones is working. Uh, you know Stephen Jones. You should interview Stephen Jones. Uh, <laughs> I know Stephen Jones. Uh, Stephen, I, Stephen Jones is one of the, at this point, one of the patron saints of this project. Uh, although I, I can, I can tell you already what he's going to sh say when I send him this video, which is uh, Hannibal, your work doesn't have enough lived ritual performance. Um, <clears throat> it's in a very Good grouchy accent. Good and, uh, <laughs> but uh, Stephen Jones is amazing. Stephen Jones is working up uh, around Yangao, which is um, northeast of Datong. So definitely in the same area. Okay. Um, and he's done some work. I mean, he's Stephen Jones has been everywhere. So, 
uh, he, he's kind of circled around this this whole rep. But his main research site is is up in, in Yungo, which is right along the uh, Great Wall here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, so just to to flesh this story out a little bit. So we're, we're talking about murals, uh, or I'm talking about murals. One of the things I'm talking about is murals. Uh, and, and so to, to kind of continue this story, um, all right, so everything gets built in the early part of the 16th century. And you can demonstrate that within the way that I just showed. But most of the, so if you walk into a village today, most of what you see is not from the 16th century. Um, <clears throat> because it's people, essentially people repair stuff, obviously. Um, so this is a map um, of uh, all of these steles. There's a somebody published this giant collection of steles from U County, and I went through it. And you could I, you, then, again, you could uh, substantiate this with with collections of steles from other places, and I think it would tell you almost the same story. Um, so so basically, this is um, this is kind of a physical culture history of U County in a graph. Um, so these are um, all of, and, and specifically rural U County. So U County outside of the walled county seat. Um, and it's saying, okay, so this is uh, repairing temples versus building temples. And uh, so I read all, it's something, I don't know, it's like 150 stele text. So it's not infinitely large uh, survey collection, but it, it's not too small either. Um, uh, so basically, you have a small body of steles which record the building of these new things in the early 16th century, but we don't have a huge textual record from that period, and that's one of the big problems with this. Um, but then, and then for a while, there's not very much, right? You have a couple things, you know, one or two steles from the, the 17th century. But then right around, uh, let's say, the, the mid-18th century, you get this massive kind of boom in, in repairs, right? Suddenly, everything has to be repaired. And when you think about why would that be? Why, why would it be the case that suddenly in, you know, like let's say roughly around 1750, you know, every village in the county just has to repair its temple. <laughs> the, I mean, the, 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 the obvious answer to that is, well, almost all of the temples were about built about 200 years before that. And you think 200 years go by, your temple gets pretty dilapidated, it starts to fall over and suddenly uh, you have to repair it en masse, right? So then uh, over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, you get this kind of, people adding things into the system. So repairing temples, adding new temples around the old temples. And this continues uh, more or less on to the present. So when we look at U County, at, at the culture of this, this kind of area in North China, what we're seeing is this kind of repair and expansion of a landscape that was created in the, the early 16th century. Um, <clears throat> And, and so a lot of the stuff I'm, I'm obviously I'm going to show you is like clearly not from the 16th century. Uh, right. And I'm not, I'm not even right. focused on the 16th century uh, when I'm talking about murals. Uh, but, you know, because you have this kind of long process of like upkeep uh, on this landscape and, and people, you know, your temple starts to, you know, the new county they call it Chidao Bata, falling over in sevens and collapsing in eights. Uh, and, and, and so you, you have a whip around, you, you put it back together and you paint new pictures on the wall and maybe you add another little temple to some new God on the side and then it kind of continues that way and people do this today. Um, we can skip over this, this doesn't matter. So basically what I've been doing is um, to just, uh, just, this is the last part of this introduction then we can go and talk about whatever you want. But uh, the, um, so Hrotters went around to all these places. Um, so this is a photo that Hrotters took in the 19, 40s, early 1940s, um, of a Dragon King temple. Um, and uh, almost none of the places that Hrotter saw now survive, um, mostly because a lot of the areas that he was working with uh, had the terrible luck of becoming like model counties during the Cultural Revolution. Um, so uh, <clears throat> they just got completely mulched. I mean, uh, there's nothing that remains there. Uh, but so I've been basically going around, um, spent at this point, what, two or three years, two and a half years in the field uh, in North China, trying to figure out ways that we can kind of reconstruct or see what Hrotter saw. Um, uh, so, uh, for instance, this is one of the very few temples that is still there. Uh, this is the same place, I think. Um, uh, I took this photo in 2018. Uh, and if you go into it, um, you do have these incredibly damaged murals inside. So this is a Dragon King temple. Uh, you know, you see the, the mother of waters, who's um, uh, the main deity, the five Dragon Kings. And, and basically what's happened to this is that, uh, you know, when the Cultural Revolution, or probably the Great Leap Forward happened, uh, people plastered, you know, you didn't have big buildings in these villages. 
So what people did is they took the old temple, they plastered over the wall and they turned it into, you know, a party meeting house or a schoolhouse or something, probably both. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but the murals were still there under the plaster. So after the um, reform and opening in the late 1970s, uh, somebody from the village came in and, and scraped off all the plaster to reveal these, um, I think these are probably 18th century murals uh, underneath. Uh, so you have a lot of cases like this where you, you have these old structures that have been preserved through these uh, kind of weird little local histories. And if you go around looking for them, you can find them. Um, uh, they're often not being protected. So that's what I've been doing, basically. I've been, you know, going kind of village to village, kind of searching for these things that still survive in one way or another uh, and trying to build up a, a, a body of, of stuff. Oh, yeah, let me interrupt just to, <laughs> there's, there's a, so, so Hannibal has an incredible website that really documents um, these murals really well. Um, and uh, and I'll link to that below. Um, I'm showing there right now, so we can see. I, I like the stupid Billy Eilish video. Whenever I open up a new tab, isn't it terrible? Um, <laughs> what? There it goes. Anyway, the Rosary of Walls. A Rosary of Walls. And it used to be called Temple Trash, and then I changed it because nobody liked that. <laughs> I know I liked it, but I understand. Uh, you, I, anyway, it's a work in progress, but um, but it's an incredible work in progress. Um, uh, so, but so people, uh, I'll, I'll link to this, and people will be able to go to find all of this stuff there. As as long as we're here, let me just say, if you if you go to the site, that the actual the, the bones of the site are in the category and that categories and navigation page. Uh, so uh, this is my attempt to make sense of the stuff that I've seen. So you have it all uh, categorized by deity, by genre, uh, by uh, location, um, uh, by period, uh, by venue. So like what kind of temple is it? Uh, and then explanations of what each of these things kind of mean. Um, just, so just so you know, if I was giving out PhDs, I would give you one for this. Uh, th thank you. Uh, you can uh, pl please. Well, I'd say you should tell that to my advisor, but please don't tell that to my advisor. I, I'll send you a black belt because that I can give out. Uh, okay. I actually have a black belt. Long oh, time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Eight years when I was a teenager. Um, All right. Uh, uh, so anyway, so that, that's the thing. So yeah, if, if at this point, if you're sick of me talking about like- No, no, no. Go back to your lecture. It, it's great. I, I get- Put, take us back to your lecture because I, I know what you have coming there and, and I think the structure of it's really well set up. It's just long, that's all. Um, I'll have to put a preface to tell people that, that, that they should jump around if, they're, if it's moving too slow for them. But I, it's not moving too slow for me. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that this, this stuff is spectacular. We, we could stop for a moment because I, I know one of the things in trying to, uh, a, a lot of people heard of the Cultural Revolution, maybe read a couple books or saw a movie, and they have a, a sense like it was really, really bad, and then it was over. Um, and if you talk to, if you're, if you're in the Chinese martial arts world, and you talk to Chinese martial artists, well, if they come from Taiwan, they're like, well, I don't know very much about it. Those communists, they suck. If you're talking to someone from China, they're like, oh, it wasn't really that bad. And this is a cultural tradition where you you know you're not unless you're really really close to them, they show you a smile. They don't give you the um, they don't tell you the story. Um, but if you get them drunk and you get close enough, they will be in tears. It's a very very dark time. But that's the other thing that people don't realize is that. And I, I mean, this is sort of, this is actually not just my framing. Uh, um, Goussart actually, I think is the person, the first person who said it, um, is that there really, there was a war that started, you know, at the beginning of the Boxer Uprising and it, and it lasted until the end of the Cultural Revolution, um, which was a war on, on, he thinks of it as a war on religion. I think of it as a war on the combination of theater, martial arts and religion, that they were all, under siege for that entire period, off and on in various ways. Um, so, uh, what really happened to these villages in the Cultural Revolution? Can you? I don't. I don't. We don't need a giant thing, but like you said, it was turned to mulch. Um, 
one of the things that you realize kind of bouncing around the Chinese countryside uh, for a while is that like almost every county had its own experience in this period. Um, and you, um, some places seem to have just kind of slipped through unscathed, um, a very small minority of places. And some places, every single religious building structure idea person was systematically demolished. Um, and in some cases it's all been built back and in some cases, nothing. Um, and and I, I've never found a clear explanation of why. Uh, Stephen Jones mentions this in one of his books where he's going around looking for Taoists. And in some places there's a Taoist in every village and in some places nobody's ever met a Taoist. Um, uh, but you, know, you had a, a series of, as you said, a series of kind of campaigns. So early in the 20th century, you had these campaigns to you know, basically decommission temples, uh, turn them into schoolhouses, et cetera, which didn't really affect these rural areas uh, in the north and west that I'm that I'm working in uh, that much, although it did affect the city. So a lot of big urban temples got decommissioned in this period. Uh, and then um, you had the when the communists took over, you had the Great Leap Forward, where, um, you know, basically all the temples were at that point converted into schoolhouses or whatever else. And then in the Cultural Revolution, uh, which was Mao's kind of big culture war, um, uh, you know, all the temples were knocked down. Uh, some areas, you know, every single temple was knocked down. Some areas that just got boarded up and they got opened up afterwards. Um, some areas, um, you know, every kind of religious professional was systematically persecuted. Some areas it seemed like, okay, they, they went out to work in the fields for 10 years and came back. Um, so it's really differential. And, and that's kind of the interest of, of doing this because you go to a new area and suddenly you see some other aspect of it has survived really intensely. Um, okay. So, so um, I'm, I'm just going to push you back in into what you were talking about. Uh, we have this, we have this cultural milieu where there's these people there um, who are, I, I guess they're part of garrisons, right? They're, they're actually under um, people who have read uh, uh, the, the, the boxer uprising by um, uh, the guy at UC Berkeley. I forgot his name. Uh, darn it. Anyway, uh, he he mentioned he he one of the one of his theories about the origins of the boxer uprising was that the confusion between the two types of law that there was civil law and there was military law. And I presume that a lot of these villages were under military law, Wan and Wu, right? Do you know there were garrisons at some point? A period. So, um, I mean, do you, you want me to go on a whole a whole fortress spiel? I can, I can go on a whole fortress. Yeah. Spiel. Look, well, well, what I what I what I was trying to get at. Okay, here's what I was trying to get. So that, anyway, look, that's that's a question then. So you mm -hmm. don't have a clear answer, um, or you don't have an instant answer, I should say. <laughs> um, it, really, it depends what period and what village. I think is the good. Uh, good. Okay. So so um. So you have this structure. You have a basic structure of these villages. It's a wall. And anybody who was not inside the wall in this period where the Mongols were raiding was killed. And they took anything that wasn't nailed down, basically. And so the walls were really important. So the, I, I just want people to get their mindset in that. There are these hordes of Mongols coming through on horseback with who are ferocious warriors. And the thing protecting you is this flimsy little wall. <laughs> Let me let me do the the I'll, I'll do a fortress spiel and I, I can yeah, tell you yeah. this is this is one half of the project. So like what was okay? So I have all this stuff. These are just pretty pictures of the environment. Uh, if you like pretty pictures, this is what North China looks like. It is dry. It's pretty. Um, these are houses. I put this together. Summer. It's very green. Anyway, we'll, let's let's skip on down through this stuff. Uh, Those are incredible pictures, by the way. <laughs> Just giving, I like, so I like to, I like things that I can see. I like talking about places that I've yeah. been. Uh, what is that? What is that? Is this like a temple of caves? There's like a mountain of full of caves just up a little bit. Oh uh, yeah. So, so this is kind of East and West of the yellow river. So East of the yellow river, you have these kind of huge flat plains uh, mm -hmm. cut through by mountains like this. Um, and then if you cross the yellow river to the West into the, uh, you know, kind of, what's called the, the Yellow Earth Plateau, the Lust of the Huangtu Gaoyuan, uh, you have these kind of like incredible erosive landscapes. Um, uh, this, is, this is one of the old fords on the Yellow River. 
uh, where you have this kind of broken erosive landscape where people live in uh, cave houses. So um, uh, yeah, so you, the, you know, they have these kind of arched, uh, you know, the main architectural form is the arch where people build these kind of arched caves or, or, or barrel vaulted houses uh, outside. Uh, and then and live in, they're actually very uh, nice inside. They're kind of like hobbit holes. Uh, but I, I'm just giving a sense of, of what this kind of world looks like. Th these, are, these are cave houses. Um, so you have two kind of different uh, geographical areas, one of which is east of the river and one of which is west of the river. And mm -hmm. um, find myself uh, circling back and forth between them. Um, these are just pictures of uh, the way it looks now. You have these kind of old towns and then massive new cities kind of rising up beyond. This is in the U County seat where they're knocking down the old city because the Olympics are going to be there. Um, uh, yeah. Um, this is the, the gate of the, uh, the old U County seat, the big old gatehouse. Um, is, what deity is installed there? I don't think any deity is installed there now, unfortunately. Uh, so this has all been reconstructed uh, originally. But that's the front gate. So was that Guan Yu or was that? Um, it probably would have been Wenchang. Actually, no, that's not true. So this this is the old tower to to Wenchang. This is the the Zhonggulo, the uh -huh. bell bell tower in the center. Wenchang is the deity of of uh, literature. I'm actually not. That's a good question. I'm actually not sure what deity originally sat inside the old uh, gatehouse here. Uh, this is a view from the gatehouse where you have these long straight streets that run through the city. Uh, I was going to took this in 2018. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, okay, so let, let's talk about fortresses. All right, so, um, and uh, who built the fortresses, who lived in them, what do they do? Uh, so, um, all right, so we're up here in the north. Uh, this is the Great Wall of China. Uh, so if, and the important thing, so, um, uh, the important thing to know about this area is that there are actually two main Great Wall lines uh, in the Ming. So you had an inner, so if, I don't know if you've ever, have you ever been to Beijing? Yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen Did that. you go to the Great Wall while you were there? Yes, yeah. Yeah, and you go up on the, you drive north of the city and you go up in the mountains and there's this massive stone wall and it's super spectacular and you've all seen pictures of it. You went to that one probably. I went to a couple. I've been, I've <laughs> traveled around a little. Okay. Some pretty rural I, areas too. There, there's there's an inner wall and there's an outer wall. So the inner wall is the one that most people see, which is the one near Beijing, which is, um, you know, because it defends the capital, it's this massive, like stone, spectacular construction. And then you have the outer wall, which is this one, which as you can see is a lot crappier. Mm -hmm. uh, and the villages that I'm studying, especially uh, in and around Yu County are, um, are between the two walls. Mm -hmm. uh, and and, and I've, you'll never find a source that, that says this, but, Essentially, what the, I, I think what was what was happening here was that the, this this defensive system worked in the sense that Mongols almost never passed the inner wall. They passed in the whole history of the Ming Dynasty. They crossed the inner wall exactly twice, um, but they crossed the outer wall every year. <laughs> so what this did, this whole and you, you'll never find a source that says this because I think they didn't want to admit it. But what, the system worked in the sense that it channeled Mongol raiding into this catchment area between the two walls, which is where all these villages were. Mm -hmm. So what happens? So in, in 1449, there's this big battle, uh, which is called the the, the, Tumu, the Battle of Tumu, Tumu Jibian, um, which is this this kind of fantastic story where you have this Yu County's most famous son is this kind of villainous eunuch called Wang Zhen, who uh, who who misleads the young emperor to, to go on a trip to his hometown of Yu County. This is the most famous thing that's ever happened to Yu County, uh, and uh, the the emperor rides out and um, uh, runs into a, a, a the the horde of Essen Khan, who's uh, the major major kind of West Mongol Khan at this this period, who. Um, it, sort of encircles him in this fort north of Beijing called Tumu, uh, which is still there. Um, and uh, they, they get they get stuck in the fort for a couple days while the Mongols are riding around outside and you have this massive imperial army that's kind of jammed into this fort and there's no water. So at a certain point, they decide they're gonna make a break for it to get back to Beijing. They, they kind of burst out of the fort and their horses haven't drunk any water in a couple days. So their battle formation sort of immediately disintegrates because the horses are running for the river. And the Mongols just cut through them, decimate this entire imperial army, and capture the Ming Emperor. 
uh, and and lead him off into and a couple they have no the Mongols clearly have no bloody idea what to do with the Ming Emperor. This is not something they ever expected to get. Uh, so they 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 kind of keep him captive for a couple of years and then they decide he's just too much trouble. So they let him go and send him back. But um, uh, this this kind of decimates the Ming imperial northern defense. So after this, you know, basically the Ming are terrified of um, you know kind of riding out against the Mongols. And every year the Mongols, and they're also refusing to trade with the Mongols because the Mongols are evil and they're bad. So every year you get these Mongol raids that cross the border and end up kind of pillaging through this interwall area. Um, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and so over the course, and this, this goes on until about 1572 when uh, they, they sign a peace treaty and they open up trademarks and basically that solves the problem. Uh, but you have this long uh, sort of what, I guess 120 year period uh, between 1449 to 1572, where essentially, if you lived in North China, you knew you were going to get raided. And that raid was coming usually in the fall because that's when the horses were fat and that's when the, you know, the grain was coming in. So it was a good raiding period. Um, and so basically you had these armies that would cross the border and you, they would pillage and they would kill whatever they could. Uh, they would you know, take the, the, the women and the artisans back into Mongolia. Um, and then you had a year to get ready for it because you, you knew it was coming back. And so you have this kind of evolutionary response over this period uh, where you know, everything gets walled. So for instance, this is a picture of the walls of the U County seat uh, where you have the, it's, it's moated by the river and it has these massive walls. So you know, every city has these huge walls and gates. That's a, that's a temple to the Jade Emperor on that. We'll talk about that a little later. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pause for a second because I think, uh, uh, in the, in the martial arts world, lots of people know about the general Qi Ji Guan. And General Qi Ji Guan was fighting in this area in the in the in the 1540s, sort of that. And so was his father. Mm -hmm. um, and so he, you know, he gets his chops, he gets a reputation for developing new uh, defensive strategies. And so they go, Well, you're so good at that. Why don't you go fight the Wako down in Fujian? Mm -hmm. Um, and then he completely fails, and then he and he rebuilds an entire new army in order to fight in this new context. And then he writes a book, which has this sort of origin of Tai Chi in it, this poem, which is really a kind of show tune. Um, and then he and and then he's sent back to fight the Mongols again, and then he's deposed. But the but it's fascinating because all of these fights um, were basically a failure of diplomacy. Absolutely. Yep. And it's very much a connected world. So you have these, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know this literature as well as I should, but you, you absolutely have these people like Ji Qi Guang and a number of other people who are being shuffled from the north to the south. So if you come up with a strategy that works against the Mongols, well, okay, go down and, and fight the, the Woko. You know, if you come up with a strategy that works against the Woko, okay, go out to Korea and fight the, you know, against um, Hideyoshi, whatever his name is. Um, uh, and so you have this over this period of this kind of like it's sort of insurgency war um, where you have it's not, you know, except for Hideyoshi Toyotomi, uh, you don't have these like large scale conventional invasions that are holding territory. What you have is these kind of little groups of raiders, sometimes not so little groups of raiders, but certainly, you know, they're not trying to conquer territory. They come, they, they take stuff, they leave. Right. And the Ming have, are over the course of this period, developing these techniques to deal with this, this, whether you're talking about military techniques, whether you're talking about kind of like religious techniques, or whether you're talking about something that's kind of in between, like, like uh, you know, Tai Chi, right? Um, and and, and Ji Qi Kuang is absolutely one of these people who, who's writing these books, like, you know, how to defend the Northern border, how to organize people, how to, you know, train troops, how to do, you know, uh, what are the, you know, Tai Chi techniques that will help you do this. So this is all part of the same kind of cultural story of like the collapse of late Ming power um, and the effect that it had on these people. And kind of if you were living through that, what did you then do, right? What, 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 what were the techniques that you used? Um, so th again, th that's I think where this does connect into the whole world of Tai, and probably people up here were doing Tai Chi and Kung Fu too. I just, uh, for, especially for uh, Ming. No, so I just because I, because I, I, some people will, there's a there's a certain small percentage of people will freak out at what you just said. I'll just just put a little <laughs> space on it. That the this that's certainly the good description of what of what Chi Chi Guan was doing, but. Um, we don't really know what that thing he wrote was for. 
because he didn't really say other than, hey, this thing is good for morale. Right. Um, really all he says about it. Um, but but I, I think the, just to sort of add, you're painting this sort of picture, right? And I'm like, oh, actually, this is a, a weird segue, but well, I was in Turkey, right? And I saw in Cappadocia mm -hmm. and they have this, these, 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 they look like piles of cheese with little mouse holes in them. And they're like, and they have these underground cities. It's, it's crazy. They're, and you really, when you're there, you're like, wow, these were really little Christians who are really scared. <laughs> and they're just hiding in the most unhospitable place and hoping that nobody notices they're there, you know, and it, that's, and it, they created this gorgeous, bizarre little environment. But, mm -hmm. um, but that there's something to that here that, that they're like, um, they're, they've, they've, they've built these temples in this certain sort of structure and they put these amazing murals on the walls and they're, there, you know, every few years there's a famine, there's a, there's, there's a drought, like droughts were horrible in this area, right? There's a drought. Well, I think it's, uh, Stephen Jones says there was a drought nine out of 10 years, something as their joke, their local joke. Um, uh, there's, there's, um, there's, there's plague coming through there all the time. There's, um, uh, and, and they have this, they don't have, they can't pick up the phone and say, hey, would you guys send over some supplies for the, you know, so we can rebuild this wall or whatever. They're like, when they go out, they have to actually send out a group of organized armed people, mm -hmm. right? To yeah. go and send, just to send a message or just to like set up a, some kind of trade in the future, right? So they need incredibly sophisticated social organizations and that religion played a huge role in that. So I just kind of wanted to, set that up no absolutely and, and you're right what you say that it's uh you know the the problem with Ji Qi Guang and, and knowing what people were actually doing in the Ming is is always there and you always have to be aware of it right where um you know I have a I, what I have is like I have things they built and then things they wrote about what they built does that mean they were doing kung fu? I don't know. <laughs> they didn't say that. <laughs> um, so I can, yeah. So so that you're you're right to point. That is kind of the problem where you kind of want it to be this stuff. You know, you want it to be. Oh, well, it was all you know. You know, kung fu and tai chi and this stuff. And they didn't say that. No. You know, what, what in terms of the government manuals, what they usually say, okay, this is about organizing people. And in terms of temple stellas, what they usually say, we'll we'll look at some. I can show you some some kind of temple stuff in a bit. Uh, what they usually say is, well, you know, this is about, you know, the, the, the Shen Bing, the, um, you know, the, the holy spirit um, soldiers. Spirit warriors, yeah. Um, anyways, let's look at some fortress. Okay. So this, this is a big Ming garrison fort. It's up in the Tibetan border. And so over the, this whole period, you get covered with these massive fortresses, uh, these, and they're just they're everywhere in North China. I mean, they're a dime a dozen. You can't move for tripping over a giant fortress like this. Um, and then you get, uh, as you said, that communications was a huge problem. So you get these like watchtower systems. And if you if you wander around up there, you realize I mean, North China is just covered in these giant mud mounds. And that's because you had these incredibly elaborate signaling systems. So this is a, a signaling tower uh, where you would you would light fires or flags during the day on the top to, to signal, you know, if you saw a Mongol, right? And they're just everywhere. They're just sitting on the fields, these walled signaling towers from this period. Um, you also have up in the hills these kind of refuge forts. So, you know, I tend to talk about these these villages that fortify themselves. But the other thing that you could very plausibly do is just, you know, run for the hills, right? And so you have, if you go up in the mountains, you find these kind of like walled off cliffs, uh, you know, which pr presumably, I mean, I don't know, I don't have a date on this. This, you know, you, you see, there's this wall and this gate built along the top of this uh, giant kind of um, mesa-like thing here. Uh, you know, presumably this was somebody who was hiding from the Mongols or I don't know, um, maybe Japanese, but um, uh, here's another one uh, up in the hills in U County where you have, um, you know, I don't, I don't think this fortress was ever inhabited. It's just, you know, the village nearby kind of built the structure um, and it's just sitting there now and somebody's using it as an orchard. Did it have um, water? It must have water. Not, that's the thing. Uh, so yeah, so like you couldn't- um, Had a well of some kind. <laughs> I don't think a lot of these things were meant to be used for long-term defense. You know, the Mongols would come, they would circle you for a couple of days and then they would, they didn't have water themselves. So they would go off. Right. Um, 
and these are just pictures of fortresses. And one of the other things you have, which I think is really interesting, is that you know if you had something important that you couldn't move, you put a wall around it. So uh, you have all of these walled monasteries, actually, which is really interesting. Uh, so this is a walled Tibetan monastery up on the up in the edge of Tibet, where they're getting attacked by Mongols at the same time. Um, uh, here's a one in, in central Shanxi where um, this, you know, there's this big old monastery out in the field, you know, you couldn't move it, you didn't want it to get blown up by Mongols, so you put a giant wall around it. Uh, here, here's what's inside. So the only things in rural China that, that survive from before this fortification period are things that end up getting walls around them. This is the interior, this like old Song Dynasty stuff. Um, and then you have this generation of people like Ji Qi Guang, uh, is it Qi Qi Guang? I always mix it up. Qi Qi Guang. Qi Qi. Qi 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 Guang, yeah, okay. Uh, this generation of officials who are kind of going around trying to figure out how do we, how do we kind of restructure society so it, it holds against this kind of attack, you know, either through, you know, military means or through magical means. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this, uh, these are family portraits in the Yu County Museum of this uh, family, um, uh, of this a Ming official called Hao Jie, um, who um, I think was a maybe a generation after Ji Qi Guang, uh, mm -hmm. but he was one of the people who organized the Ming offense, defenses against Toyotome Hideyoshi. Uh, and he wrote one of the first Chinese studies of Japanese history. Um, these are from his, uh, in the museum there, they have all the portraits from his ancestral temple. Uh, and he sponsored um, the the works of um, probably the the at least in the north one of the the greatest kind of thinkers about village defense who was this person called Yin Gung. Uh, he wrote all the prefaces for Yin Gung's work. And Yin Gung would was this guy from Yu County actually who would go around into villages and wrote these kind of manuals like how to how to fortify your village. So the Mongols are coming. Uh, how do you um, organize people to defend against this. He has this great phrase he uses at one point in his book where he, I forget the phrase, the wording in Chinese, says what, uh, so the, uh, if you have a, a fortress but you do not have a defensive system then it is simply a lump of dirt. Um, <clears throat> yeah, okay. So he's talking about how to, how to like, you know, form village militias to, to fight, right? Um, I can, if you're interested, I, I can kind of, um, I had translations of some of his stuff that I can, I can show you, but, uh, cool. Yeah. Um, what you get over this period is this, this, this landscape where everything is walled. So, uh, you know, every village kind of builds a fort, right. And, 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 and now the, often the village has spread out outside of it. Uh, but you just, you know, every, you know, everyone was kind of doing this. Uh, over the course of this period, and 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 the walls are kind of still there today. If you, if you want, do you want to you want to read some Yin Gung stuff? I, I I pulled out some translations that I did a while back. Uh, I don't know if it's it's too off topic. <clears throat> Let's save that. I mean, I could maybe ask questions about it, but I really would like to see some of the visual art. So, okay, yeah, let, let's go into. Okay, let, let's 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 move out of fortresses. All right, so. Um, all right, and so when you built a fortress, uh, the other thing that you did was you built temples around the fortress, uh, right. and these temples are not randomly located. So, so one of the things that I spent a long time doing is mapping villages uh, and interviewing old people to try to figure out where the temple, you know, because now like half the temples have disappeared, uh, and so um, uh, you don't necessarily know where it all was. But these fortresses were planned settlements, and you had temples that were, were placed at particular places within the village. And you can usually there'd be a temple to Jenwu in the north, and then a temple to some sort of female deity, usually either Guanyin or the Taishan Nianyang, the, the, the goddess of Taishan uh, in the south. And then you might have other uh, temples that would be kind of scattered around. And the, the Guanyin temple was outside the gate, is that right? Interestingly, yes. Um, and, and I'm not sure uh, whether that was the, would have been the case in the Ming period. So of course, after 1570, right, you know, the, there's peace and basically this whole area just remains peaceful until the Japanese invade in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. So you have this long period where people are kind of expanding. Uh, you know, the, the fortress is small. So, you know, people build houses outside. There's not, you don't want a temple and you want an opera stage. So you put an opera stage outside. Uh, and, and so you get these these landscapes that kind of expand outside of the original. Uh... I, I have a theory uh -huh. about that, which is that, that of course the goddess of mercy is is like the um the one who takes in travelers so 
you, you, you actually, see I a temple. Stella is somewhere that more or less says that. that yeah, that, so it was a temple where, you know, where people who are like hungry and thirsty could come. They didn't bring you directly into the city. They're like, oh, we'll help you right out here in front. Sort of mm -hmm. like we don't, we don't bring all the riffraff into the city, but we do want to help you. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you get this, this kind of really complicated, but like intentionally built spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they often have these little temple clusters around the gates because naturally enough, like you're going to build a temple where you're going to put it eh, like we don't have space within the fort. Let's just stick it outside the gate. Um, <clears throat> so let's go. Um, I can show you this. Uh, it's all sorts of fun stuff with this. You have these weird cults that worship cities uh, as, as like eschatological paradises. Um, uh, we don't have to talk. That's just random. That's thing. pretty interesting. There's Isn't that from that from a Baojuan or something? What is that? That's from there's this guy uh, Tosin Yu uh, who who somehow got the the library. He's a scholar in Beida. Um, uh -huh. I I met him, and he I, this is this is scanned out of his book. He somehow got the library of this uh, insane kind of cult that was up there. Uh, which seems to have kind of late Ming origins, although it's pretty murky, but they they believe that this interwall region was like this kind of eschatological holy land, uh, which was, and it's just that we can't see it, you know, so they'll always say, okay, the, you know, the holy land is here, but, you know, we, we just see it wrong. And so this is it's this yeah. like, Taoist Birdman mountain map of, uh, of, of like the geography of North China, all the different fortresses. And then this is, they believe the holy city was this particular, uh, kind of provincial town north of Beijing called Stranhua, uh, which was the the palace of the northern the northern dipper. Yeah, here's all and the they, star constellations here. They would map it. They called it Yincheng, the, the silver city. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and they would kind of produce these maps of the city as um like the dipper paradise, which is just blows my mind that there's like fortress paradise. Anyway, I <laughs> I just threw this in there because I thought you'd appreciate it. Um <clears throat> You're right. <laughs> let's let us uh scroll the heck down here all right so let's talk about uh temple towers so um <clears throat> okay so the most important type of of fortress temple was this thing which weirdly enough doesn't have a name in chinese um so famously okay all chinese cities they're axial and they're built on like a you know a north south plan right so you have a gate facing south and you have this kind of axial lane with uh you know the most important buildings built on the central line so this is the forbidden city in uh beijing and um so the emperor would live in this these big buildings right down the center line of beijing city and this very kind of cosmic symbolism the whole nice thing and and what you realize is that most of these little fortresses and and even county towns were built this way too so this is a map of uh, a particular county town where you see you have uh three gates in the in the east, west, and south, uh, and then an axial line. And then at the north, you have this giant tower, which is uh, here written Beijing, so that the tower of the, the northern pole star. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a temple to Genwu, essentially. And and usually these, uh, here, here's another picture of it from the Gazetteer. Um, and you had these everywhere in North China. And they're, they're kind of the least well-studied temple form in, in China, I think, because you, suddenly you realize that like, North China was this landscape of towers. You had these massive towers everywhere, these temples on top, and, and nobody's kind of, I've never seen anybody who's really dug into this. So why were these temples on towers? What did it mean to build a temple on a tower as opposed to a temple at the ground level? And usually, um, here's another old photo of one from uh, Northwest China, actually in Ningxia. Um, uh, and, and usually, so it's usually a temple to Genwu, but it's not always a temple to Genwu. So it can be a temple to other male deities. I've only ever found one to a female deity. Um, uh, which female know. deity and which other uh, male de deities? So um, usually it will be um, most common as Genwu and it seems to have become sort of fixed as Genwu. I, have, I, I think I can prove actually from my data that it roughly around 1520, uh, it got fixed and these temples are all to Genwu and before 1520, it was kind of hetero heterogeneous, at least in Yu County, but mm -hmm. elsewhere in North, and this is a thing that happens all across North China and, and it's often to the Jade Emperor, um, the Yu Hong Dadi or to um, sometimes to uh, the um the the hei hu the, the, the dark the black world. tiger the um dark, yeah. uh and, and you'll often have multiple shrines on the same thing but usually it's this kind of male god who who sits on this tower at the northern kind of axis of the fort 
um what was the one you said there was one to a female deity i was just curious which which oh one? uh there was some weird fort that had a temple to the Niang Niangs, the the uh -huh. Taishan. um and i that 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 that, that that it also wasn't on the north; it was in the west for some reason. Okay, okay. Those but people but, weird. but uh, I it's if I have talked about this a little bit that the uh, the in in the journey to the north epic, the um, Jun Wu is actually created initially as Xuan Wu, mm -hmm. and yeah. it's because the Jade Emperor looks down. And he sees something really that he really values. It's a, it's a, a vase, but it's probably symbolically sexual, something sexual. And he and one of his hun flies out, and then mm -hmm. Xuanwu is born and has um, I think seventy two rebirths before he actually becomes Junwu. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, Xuanwu is I, I think historically is the older deity, right? So you had the four guardian deities, the different directions, and Xuanwu is the tortoise and snake. Who guards the north? Uh, and then at a and certain that goes back. That goes back to the, the maybe fifth century BC. It's pretty right. far back. And then I think in the in the Song you get this new deity who's kind of a like a anthropomorphization of. It's also connected. I'll, I'll talk in a bit. It's connected to uh, Vaishravana, so the Bo Buddhist deity in the north, and and Vaishravana practices in the Tang. I think. Um, <clears throat> But we'll uh, we'll look. I have some uh, like Genwu uh, biographical murals. They're fun. We can, we can read okay, them. Okay. Okay. Go. Oh, great. Let's do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this okay. is like this conversation is so huge. <laughs> yeah. I just there's everything. I could talk about this forever. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, I'll, uh, you're you're good to push me along with it because I, I could just dive into like you know the minutia of like village militia organization in the 16th okay. century. And you'd never so there we can see in the back. We can see the Genwu Temple. Yeah, right. So this is like a, a really nice uh, axial village fortress in New County where you have a, a, a gate that faces south, right? So we're looking at the gate. This is a, a probably built in the 16th century, repaired later on. Uh, and then you have an axial road which leads due north. And then at the end of this kind of axial uh, axial road, you have this, this temple which sits on the northern wall of the fort and it's a temple to Genwu. So Genwu is this kind of panoptical god. He, he kind of looks out over the space of the fort and the, and the landscape. Uh, and um, and so if you go up, this is a, in the Yu County seat. This is a temple to the the, the Yu Hong, the the Jade Emperor, mm -hmm. um, and and he kind of commands the whole landscape in these kind of axial views. So you very much have this sort of axial or panoptical symbolism, where you have this deity who kind of looks out uh, over the landscape. And this is the murals uh, in the that temple. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about. Um, let's see, is there anything else I wanted to say with this? Uh, yeah, you have this. Oh, the other god you sometimes get are the, the three officials, the Sanguan, mm -hmm. the um uh that's another one that sometimes shows up. So the 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 god, the Taoist official of uh what's it, heaven, earth, and water. Oh, the yeah, yeah. The um they're like emissaries. Sometimes it's translated emissaries. Uh right. And and you sometimes you get uh in weird and interesting stuff. So one thing that I've been chasing recently is uh this 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 thing called a sataya. Uh uh, a monastery tower. So it appears that in this period when everybody was getting attacked, uh, you would have monasteries that actually built these things. So you have places that aren't even kind of villages building these kind of towers in the north that just seem to be this architectural form that's associated with this defense. So you have these nice steles. This is one that I think should be a Ming Dynasty Satai, but you have these nice steles from this period where they're talking about, um, you know, our, our monastery is getting attacked. We have all these refugees. And so we built a wall and then we built a tie. Um, you know, a, a tower or a platform. And sometimes you have villages that, you know, that it's up in the mountains, you don't really have a good fortress. So you'll just build somewhere to the north of your village on a high point, a shrine to one of these kind of axial deities. So you have down here in the lost in the hills, you have a, a little village and then north of the temple, there's a nice stele about this in the 16th century. So north of the village, they build this kind of rock shrine to the, the Jade Emperor way up here on the cliffs, um, sort of as a way of instantiating this holy geography. Mm -hmm. um even if they weren't necessarily so you want a temple to a male deity somewhere high to the north of your fort and how you manage that is kind of up to you um but let's talk about genwu so okay so who is genwu so genwu is um oh this is from a ming dynasty mural uh genwu is the guy right at center here um so he is the sort of Taoist god of the north uh he's he's always wearing black he has bare feet which makes him an exorcist 
Uh, so exorcists always have bare feet for some reason. Um, and he has his sword, which is, as you said, was given to him by the Jade Emperor. And he has his long unbound hair, which is another symbol of kind of a Taoist exorcist uh, in this um, context. And then usually, or sometimes at least, he appears in different iconographic contexts, but he's surrounded by his kind of like four buddies who are Tianpeng, who's sort of like Zhen Wu, except less so. Uh, and then uh, these guys who are uh, Yu Shang, I should get it. And those name. are maybe Indian. Yeah, uh, I never actually found that they, I think the iconography, like this kind of multi-armed, you, know, you can see they're holding badras and stuff. So it, it comes yeah. out of this kind of tantric imagination. Mm -hmm. um, but I've never actually found that these deities have an Indian, uh, they're, they're sort of like Rahu and Ketu or the, like Indian uh, stars yeah. who show up sometimes in these things. Anyway. I, I, I can say a little, a little more about that. The, the barefoot thing, um, you know, um, is, is certainly associated with um, with exorcism, but but I think it, it's you know it's to make that it's it's generally thought to show that he's rough and ready. It's like he's mm -hmm. actually ready to fight, which is a little bit strange, right? But it's it's it in it's not just. Um, associated with uh with exorcists per se but with actually people who are ready to become possessed right so it, it's actually um it's, it's, it makes him kind of a baby in a sense too there's a there's an association yeah you have all this stuff about the with the, the jin dan the uh uh inner alchemy stuff related yeah to his Which hair is isn't you see his hair is actually tied back and wild it's both mm -hmm. Um, so what they would do, and this is a symbol of the warrior cult culture of, of the long past. I don't think they were doing it at that time, but it's sort of he's an ancient warrior, right? So they would um, they would braid their hair with chain and silk to mm -hmm. make a protection for the back of the neck and then mm -hmm. leave the rest wild. Interesting. Huh. Cool. I didn't know that. All right. Well, uh, good enough. Keep going. Um, <laughs> it's just fun stuff. So, um, uh, just to give a, well, okay, we could talk about, so these are these stellar, this is this great account uh, from one of the Great Wall stations where somebody had this vision of Genwu that came to him in the in the night. But basically, all right, so why do people build temples to Genwu uh, in, in the north? Um, so I, I prepared a couple texts, we can read them, uh, or I don't know how much we want to spend on this, but... Uh, so, okay, so here is a, a temple tower to Genwu, right? So this is a Genwu temple, it's in a village, it's at the Northern Wall, you climb up this thing, little bell bell tower and drum uh, for, you know, signaling to the village. Uh, and um, in, uh, up in the, up in the um, uh, top of the um, temple is this stele, which gives an account of why they built it. So I, I actually translated this last night because uh, it's a beautiful little account. Hold on, let me um, pull it up here. Um, uh, I prepared a bunch of random stuff. We don't have to read all or even most of this, but okay. So I, I like this one. It's a, it's a lovely little account. Um, so, um, <clears throat> this is the translate, my translation, which is probably going to be wrong. Cause I just did it at like two in the morning last night, but, um, <laughs> uh, so, okay. So this is the account of, uh, repairing the temple of the perfected warrior from the late or mid 16th century. So, um, it begins. So the beginning part is damaged. So it's a lot of stuff is missing here. Um, uh, so in the eastern part of Yu County, dot, 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 in the name of the place in front of this village are famous peaks. From behind it come rich and prosperous veins of the earth. So they have this geomantic position of the village where it has the, the underground earth veins that kind of come to that spot. Uh, in front of it, a bunch of stuff missing here. Um, they harm many lives. So presumably they're talking about the Mongols here in the 10th year of the Zhengda reign, which is 1515. They planned, they got together the masses, uh, their people were being injured. And thus, how could we protect our lives and soul? Thus, the strongest, the thousand strong mass said, we can do thus, gather together the people, and that year they built a fortress. Okay, so they founded this fortress because they were getting attacked. Unfortunately, it's super damaged. They don't actually say what they were getting And attacked. people sought protection of the gods. Right. Uh, and the thus they built in that year a fortress which faced to the south with a great tower in the north. Uh, right, so gate faces south, tower in the north. Uh, for reason of these sorrows, the people sought out the protection of the gods. Um, <clears throat> all right, so here we get to the point where they're building this temple. So they built a fortress, the fortress faced south, there's a tower in the north, um, somebody's attacking them. We can fill in here Mongols, but it's damaged, they don't actually say that. Um, I think it's actually might be the case that somebody took out the part about the Mongols here, like scratched it off because 
later on when they got conquered by the Qing, they didn't want to be using rude word about rude words about northern people. Um, <clears throat> But okay, so here's the building of the Genwu Temple, right? So the residents, uh, Xu Zhizai, working together with the masses, right? Tong Zhong, so this is a collective thing that this village is doing, erected a temple on top of the tower. It had uh, some number of bays, so Chinese uh, temples mm -hmm. are built, like usually three bays, uh, and, and was painted with an image of the holy perfected warrior, holding a sword with his hair loose, the 10 generals standing in attendance around him, leading 100, 10,000 uh, of auspicious soldiers to silently pacify, some more gen, you know, some pacify in the world that we can't see or hear, uh, silently pacify the northern regions. If the belief is present, then the god will be present. Thus, the people of this fortified village held festivals and sacrifices at the proper time and did not abandon their devotion. Okay, they were getting attacked. They built <clears throat> this temple up there. It has this uh, painted iconography in it, so it's filled with murals. <clears throat> Um, over the course of the next 10 years, a number of people, the number of people gradually grew, grew and flourished such that the old fort could not contain them all and therefore they wished to expand it. Shi Yong Sen, Shi Chun, Shi Xun, Shi Zai Qi, Shi Zai Sheng, all were heads of the project. Previously, the temple tower hadn't been something missing. That the temple should be thus was urgent for the people and that they were, <clears throat> and they were remiss in, this, in their respect to the god. Therefore, the small tower was expanded into a large one. Inside the temple, there were statues of the holy perfected warrior and the 10 generals standing in attendance around him. <clears throat> On the two flanking walls were painted the images of his cultivation to sagehood, right? Th there you get the, the story, uh, which uh, you've mentioned the journey to the north. And we'll, 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 we can look at some of those in a sec. Uh, these gods would ride out and return. So true rules. So the, the gods are leaving and entering the temple, um, each manifesting his divine soldiers to protect the fort. So divine um, so soldiers the, is, is Shen Bing. Yep, Shen Bing. Um, Thus our fort's defenses were completed, and afterwards we saw not the dust of a single Mongol horse being silently protected by the divine soldiers. Sincere devotion can increase the awesome power of the god, having verified the sincere devotion of the people afterwards the residents affected it in the form of this record. Um, <clears throat> And this was written down by a student at the Confucian Academy of the U County seat. He doesn't give his name, which is weird. It might be on the back. What, what's the word for Confucian Academy? Uh, Ruxia. Ruxia. Okay, so... Yeah, uh, so yeah. The, yeah. Um, <clears throat> these people were probably like professional scriveners, basically. Uh, and it was erected in the sixth month of autumn in the Renshu year in the uh, 41st year of the reign of the Jiajing Emperor, which is 1562. Um, okay, so this is this lovely little account of what's going on with these temples. Um, so the um, you're getting attacked, right? The Mongols are coming over, people are getting hurt, so you build a fortress, right? And these fortresses have these towers in the north, uh, and so at the point where you got the fortress together, what do you want to do? Well, uh, you you build a temple and the temple is going to have, um, well, if you're poor, it's going to have murals in it. So, uh, and, and the murals will show the perfected warrior. Um, so here is another one of these. Um, this is uh, another Genwu temple uh, on the Northern wall. Um, and it has these, we talked about the cultural revolution. It says, so destroy the, uh, destroy the anything selfish. And on the other side is Li Gong, erect the common, or the, the communist, uh, which is these cultural revolution slogans that were daubed up here when this temple was knocked down. Uh, and then this is the, the, um, the murals to Genwu inside, uh, <clears throat> uh, which these are actually, so these were painted in the, in the mid 19th century. So these are mm -hmm. not from the original period, but so it would have looked something like this. Uh, where you have on the central wall, uh, you have the, you know, the Genwu Xiang who is, you know, holding his sword. Uh, he's, um, he's got his hair uh, unbound or uh, partially bound, uh, as you said. And then on the side walls, you have the 10 generals who are his 10 attendants, and they all kind of manifest their, um, uh, their Shen Bing, their, their kind of um, uh, <clears throat> holy what it was spirit soldiers right um and then the um they each represent an army and right if you ever read uh patrice Favaz's uh book about these hunanese deity statues i've seen his movie i haven't read his book no i've Is seen a book? couple of his movies i think i met him yeah i met him um get the book uh it's in french but it has pictures it's mostly you're mostly just in this for the pictures awesome i was when i read this book because what he's doing is um he has so one thing you don't have from you county is you don't have the old statues uh -huh. almost all the statues were destroyed yeah. um and the murals only remained because nobody cared about murals it's just paint on the walls um uh but he uh patrice fava and i think a, a, a number of other people working down there i don't know this field as well as i could 
uh, have been collecting these statues from Hunan and they open them up and what they have are these rolls of paper with images of the spirit soldiers. Um, and this, so uh, yeah, <clears throat> Mark Millenbuild's latest, um, latest paper discusses this. This yeah, is right. extra my mind did the same thing. Blue yeah, right. Well, I'm it's gonna very, get Mark to talk, I hope. Closely okay. connected to Mark Muhlenbelt's stuff, uh, where he's working on the same period except down south, right? Where you have very, very similar things happening. Uh, and, and this has to do with this kind of massive change in Ming society in this period when you know he's connecting it to these military cults in the south where they were getting attacked by these, you know, the Japanese pirates, the war call. Uh, and you know, very similar things are happening where they're building these temples. They're they're doing these kind of spirit soldier rituals, which again, in, in the context of these little villages, I just I, I've never found any source that tells you actually what they were doing. Right. But we, what, what, we didn't like, finish. We 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 got so excited we didn't finish. So the the statues are full of talisman, and each talisman represents particular deity that, in a sense, that deity controls. And this is so close to what I have been conceptualizing martial arts as. That's why my mind blew out because I was like, oh, there's clearly a narrative in these martial arts forms, um, mm -hmm. but, like, but it's really hard to figure out what the narrative is. And then you realize, oh, you invoke the first deity and then you invoke the second deity. And then, so you're actually just invoking a whole bunch of different deities. And then you have the power of all of them when you go to right. fight that kind of thing. Have you ever read those uh, amazing book by a Taiwanese scholar, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, called Materializing Magic Power, uh, which is her, uh, what the heck is her name? I think I've seen it. Yeah, I might've picked it up. Um, it's, um, but it's this incredible study of like spirit possession in rural Taiwan, where they have the, the Wu Ying, the, the five camps. Yes, I have read that book. Yeah, yeah. And right, and what you do as a village uh, spirit medium which you definitely did have spirit mediums uh, in this area, although again, it's really hard to know anything about what they're doing. Um, but what you did is you kind of, you, you took on the possession of the God and then you had control over the five camps in the different directions. And then you could use the spirit soldiers in those camps to defend the village. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, and it actually just, because the iconography is so cool here, you get, everybody can see the bottom of Jun Wu's foot, right? Um, there's the, the the tortoise right it's not just the tortoise i don't know if this can you see oh yeah there's the tortoise and the snake there right which 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 um which maybe they're having sex somebody pointed out the other day i don't know but they're but the bottom of his phys, it back out again just back out a little bit it's not just the foot that i was looking at it's it's the way he's holding his legs he's actually doing this this you could call it tantric or taoist thing where you're drawing everything up Right is actually that's which actually showing that fit that physicality of the golden elixir that manifest in its martial form. And uh, and the, the other thing I was going to say about the hair, it's because you see the other guys, all their hair is showing their rank. Right. They have mm -hmm. the the way their hair is tied tells you their rank. And Jun Wu has no rank. It's like he's he doesn't it's, it's this almost this thing of like he doesn't care. He's so rad, he doesn't care about rank, you know, thing, right? And it, in fact, in, in the Chinese martial arts, we have this term, sung, which is mm -hmm. like the core idea of, you know, usually it's translated as relax or sink, but it mm -hmm. actually refers to taking the hair, letting the hair go loose. Interesting. What it actually means. So I just thought I'd throw that in. All right, let's keep going with more pictures. Yeah, I, I don't know anything. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah it's tempting to read this stuff this way. And I, I, I always want, I'm, someday I'll find a source that's like, all right, this is, uh, you know, what all this means. But uh, mm -hmm. it's fascinating hearing this stuff. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of exorcism, so I'm a Tibetologist actually by training. I, I'm a historian of Tibet. This is not my main gig, right. despite the fact that I've spent like eight years doing this. Uh, the... Um, and one of the things that's going on, so um, there's been a lot of amazing stuff coming out of Tibetan studies in the last 10 years, kind of about the same period. Uh, actually, my advisor at, at Berkeley, Jacob Dalton, kind of wrote a book about this, which is how I ended up at Berkeley. But the, um, so what you have, so these Mongols, this is this kind of crazy period in Mongolia where these Mongols are just going everywhere and they're invading China, but they're also slowly over the course of the 16th century conquering Tibet. Uh, and that conquest gets finished in the 1630s where they um, set up the Dalai Lamas as kind of the rulers of Tibet. 
backed by these Mongol armies. Um, and one of the amazing things about this period is that this is this kind of great era of tantric exorcism in Tibet, uh, where you have these people, um, James Gentry at Stanford just wrote a book about this guy, uh, Soktokpa, which Soktokpa is Tibetan for the, the Mongol repeller. That was what he called himself. And he would travel the Tibet kind of doing these tantric rituals where he would, you know, repel Mongols. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and you get this very similar, and, and, and you have a very similar history in uh, Tibet and sort of Northern China in this period when you have this kind of constant warfare with these little Mongol groups who are kind of pillaging through the landscape. And you have, uh, then you have, and one of the main responses to this is this kind of tantric exorcistic uh, set of magical techniques where, again, uh, you should read James Gentry stuff because it's very similar where these techniques are conceived of in terms of like pills, uh, like substance, you know, created substances, yeah. Uh, yeah. where you, you refine a certain alchemical substance, and then that substance is, you know, enlightenment, usually it's something gross. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, and then you, you, um, then you kind of, uh, you know, put it on your tongue, and you become the deity, and then you have the deity's exorcistic powers over the landscape. Uh, where you can, you know, kind of kick the Mongols out, or you can, you know, pacify the evil spirits of this area and convert it to Buddhism. And this then becomes ultimately the, um, one of the kind of founding mythoses, mythi, myth, I mean. Mythosi, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I got gotcha. you. That's splitting the difference. Uh, mythosi of... Uh, <laughs> of the, 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 the kind of Dalai Lama state where they have these kind of massive exorcistic rituals that are, you know, um, uh, kind of converting the whole landscape to, um, uh, to Buddhism and also defeating these very real enemies who are usually Mongols uh, in the process. So it's a very kind of shared like tantric Taoist history in the 16th century where because of this kind of environmental threat all across Asia, you have these different groups. Uh, a bunch of people have written about this in the Tibetan context. James Gentry, um, my mm -hmm. advisor, Jacob Dalton, uh, uh, George Fitzherbert, who's at Oxford, who's a friend of mine. Sort of they, kind of I mean, of but even you wrote about it in the, in the Four Temples. Mm -hmm. You sort of mentioned that there's this, you know, you, you painted this vision in the, in the, four, the four forts, right? There, you painted this vision <laughs> of there's like a, you know, a, there's a Buddhist exorcist and a Taoist exorcist and like, and an, and an army right right and it's simultaneous it's yeah absolutely simultaneous and and it also you know has this um sort of artistic dimension like it produced art which is what i like but um <clears throat> you, you study martial arts because uh you you enjoy doing martial arts i study murals because i like painting um or drawing so this nice. is uh nice. so the question is okay so let's go back to um we're talking about the 16th century uh what did these temples have in the 16th century so if you remember that stele that we just read um <clears throat> it tells you that they had a couple things so they had a statue of general right and then if you had more money and you could expand it you would have a statue of general and the 10 generals uh, but if you didn't have money you would just paint them right so the murals were kind of a poor man's statue right mm -hmm. uh and this is um actually a Ming Dynasty, late Ming uh, mural of the Ten Generals, um, which I love. This is one of the most beautiful ones I've seen, uh, where you have these, you know, they they kind of um, line the walls on either side in this this kind of like military array surrounding the 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 central statue of the uh, perfected warrior, and then uh, you would also have um, this one is just so freaking gorgeous. This amazing like curly hair. Um, <clears throat> I love this. Uh, Anyway, uh, I'm just nerding out about um, murals here. Um, this is another one from the same the same set. So the um, <clears throat> and then you would also have, um, if you remember the uh, what what it referred to as the uh, the the Xuxing Gong An. So the the like cases of the Gong that the striving the you know Gong Fu the Gong. Uh, of the the cultivation of Genwu. So this is basically the story of Genwu and how he became Genwu, um, which would be these narrative images, which again, uh, Hrothe has produced this amazing. So Hrothe, for instance, was the first person to write about uh, Beioji, the journey to the north, um, <clears throat> and kind of turned a lot of people onto it. Uh, and I actually think that was a complete mistake because nobody, it's quite clear that nobody in these villages ever read Beioji, but- um, But they must have seen the plays, right? It's not the book. 
I'll, I'll show you what it is. So you can actually trace quite precisely what they were reading, interestingly. Well, this is one of the ways the various rabbit holes you can go down with this massive body of material. Um, so the, and these are, this is a, a 17th century image of the um, or mid 17th century, or early from 1640 something. That one's incredible. Um, yeah. These kind of gorgeous, sumptuous images of the generals. Oh, the, here's the uh, th that go back one that you see um, the the uh, Gong, Gong, uh, Le Gong there. Yeah, yeah, you have the uh, the the dragon up in the corner, and then the the Le Gong. So these are all coming from a, a specific set of deities, uh, which are called the the Le Bu, the the Thunder Bureau. Thunder Bureau. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, where you have yeah this guy who who kind of um, does thunder magic. You also have you ever seen there's um uh, old professor of mine has this like this wand like a genwu wand which has the the, the character lay written all down it uh uh-huh thunder yeah. thunder thunder yeah um which is uh something that i've been lusting after for years but um anyway uh <laughs> we've, we've 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 broke up for political reasons but the um anyway <laughs> Uh, the um, and then what you would also have, uh, as you remember, was actually mentioned in this uh, in this stele, is you have these narratives, these kind of panel narratives, ah. which tell the story of Genwu. Um, <clears throat> oh, with little titles on each little narration. With little titles on each little narration, so you can actually follow what the story was, um, and you can then uh, because or you could stand in front of it and tell the story and point. And, right, exactly. Uh, and you could, um, and because it's the 21st century, you can actually Google these titles and figure out what text they come from, which is great. Uh, and it, so it turns out um, that uh, here's another very faded, probably 18th century one, where you see it's just being told in this kind of fantastic landscape. This is the shitty condition that a lot of these murals are in, yeah. um, where you have the whole narrative. Um, but I've, so I've actually, um, Oh, here's another. This one's amazing. This one got a lot of these have actually been stolen since I take took this picture. So this is another general temple uh, where you have um, this the photos I took in 2013, uh, where you have this amazing image of like the palace of Genwu, with the story going on around it in this landscape. So th this is this is very late. This is probably early 20th century. Um, so, so what story were they reading? Well, let's go to it. So um, so I've actually um, done. Uh, this is, by, by the way, just to finish this, this, this is uh, the thing as it stands now. So it's been cut oh. off the wall by thieves. This yeah. is one of the reasons I set out doing this again. And because I, I kind of swore off this and was like, I'm going to go be a Tibetologist and darn these little Chinese villages that make me miserable. But uh, then uh, a bunch of stuff got stolen. So I went back to my life in 2018. Um, anyway, hey, so thank you for doing that. Uh, the, the, don't thank me. That's, uh, I've, I've been okay. <laughs> um, take it in, man. Take it in. <laughs> um, okay, so the question is, what were they, what was this story? And what you realize, um, so Hrotes wrote this study about this that everybody cites, and it's it's just wrong. It's just completely wrong in every respect, and I, it drives me crazy. Okay. Uh, so basically what happened was, um, uh, it's pretty clear here that nobody ever read this text, Journey to the North, even though now the Journey to the North gets cited as um, the main Genwu text uh, because it's been translated um, and because Hrotes wrote about it and kind of claimed that it was. Um, but what you realize is that um, the story that's in these, these things is not the story that um, uh, comes from the, the journey to the north. And actually, it seems, my theory at least, is that it has two parts. So basically there's this part that was transmitted orally, which is kind of the core biography of Genwu. And you know it's transmitted orally because each one is, is it's telling the same story, but in slightly different language. Uh -huh. So it's clear that somebody knew this story, painted it, and then kind of described it in their own words. And actually I've done interviews with uh, contemporary painters, like village painters in China in 2018, and they all know the story. Mm -hmm. you, 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 know, you ask them, okay, if you paint a Genwu temple, what do you paint? And they'll, they'll tell you this story. Um, and then what you would do is you would, you know, <clears throat> so the problem, of course, with painting a mural is that, you know, every temple has different dimensions uh, and you have a different amount of wall space. So then you need to fill up more space. So then people would take episodes from these kind of collections of um, like miracle tales, some mm -hmm. of which are fascinating. Uh, the main one that they seem to be using is this, this text called the, the Genwu Qi Zheng Lu, which I've actually translated a couple stories from. Um, but it's this like kind of amazing, like, it's a million, you know, it has hundreds of stories in it, but they they kind of, there's these interesting little cycles within it where they'll 
you know, the same place will reappear a couple hundred pages later where they're telling, you know, the later history of this particular temple. And it's sort of the epos of, uh, it's mostly set in the Northern Song. So the point where um, the Song Dynasty was fighting the uh, Khitan and the Jurchen in the North. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's kind of this, you could read it at least as this kind of bizarre, like folkic epos of the defense of the Northern Song border, where you have Genwu who's helping the Northern Song emperor, he helps these emissaries who have to cross the border and, you know, um, you know, make contact with the Jurchens. Uh, he, um, you know, there's one story where his, his kind of spirit soldiers like leap out of the painting and defeat a Jurchen army. Um, <clears throat> and so you have this kind of collection of miracle tales which would be passed around in these books uh all of which were connected in some way to this kind of um well just the, in general kind of telling the power of this god and also to the specific uh kind of nationalist defense of this border in this period and then they would get painted onto the walls uh, by these painters who are just like all right we need to fill up space let's take a couple kind of chapter headings out of this book uh but okay so what was the story that they knew like what was the 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 tale that they knew and it turns out to be based on the life of the buddha so so this is a really nice complete uh example from uh actually painted in the early 20th century um so it's late but you see the same story in the early er, early one so and it reads in let's see like upside down buddhistrophon i think is the word oh. so it reads uh from oh. left to right and then uh curving it up. up oh yes. that, but that's like that's a dragon pool Right, so, so the story goes like this, all right, so we're down here. So his mother has a dream in which the uh, moon and the sun enter her womb. Uh -huh. Again, this is, a lot of this is coming out of the life of the Buddha in its Chinese version. And then he's born uh, and he's washed by five dragons. So this, if you've ever seen pictures of the Buddha being uh, these Indian images with these five Nagas who are, are kind of open up their hoods over him to shelter him from rain. This is the Chinese interpretation of this. It comes through these uh, biographies, uh, biographies of Siddhartha and becomes, Later on, uh, you'll see the five dragons appear as this kind of element of Genwu's power, where he has control over the forces of water. Uh, and then, so Taiza Rusia, the, you know, the, the, the prince uh, begins to study, he studies, he studies, he studies. And then you have the, the famous kind of leaving the city episode, where um, he leaves the city four times. I guess we might be back over here on the, oh, on yeah. the where he sees yeah, an old a man, yeah. a sick man, a dead man, uh, and then he um, decides, and then... Uh, and then he meets a, a, a songran, a monk, and then he decides to go out and kind of seek his, his fortune. So um, he says goodbye to his parents up here, uh, and then he goes out into the wilderness. And the first thing that happens is the Yuhong Cixian, so the, the Jade Emperor gives him a sword. All right, so at this point, we've now departed from the life of the Buddha, and we're off in interesting territory. So then it continues on the other wall. Uh, let's go down here. So um, <clears throat> this is part two. I'm not exactly sure which way it's going here. So let's see. Maybe it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, so then you have, uh, he is, um, uh, let's see, monkeys and deer show him the way down here. So he's led through the forest by monkeys and deer. But of course, uh, show him the way. Yeah, well, it says Lu, so not Dao. But, oh, Lu, okay, uh, yeah, it's a path. Okay, cool. Um, and then he, I, these are, there's probably whole stories attached to these. I don't necessarily know them. So he, yeah. he, he you know, he's being pursued by, by people from the city. So he kind of cuts a chasm using his sword. Um, he has this magical sword that, that, that separates him off from the city. Um, and then uh, the Ar Arhu Badon. So he's guarded in his, his cave by these two tigers. And later on, this becomes part of his iconography where he's uh, shown with the 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 Hei Hu, who's um, Zhao Gongming, this kind of exorcist deity who appears also in the in the romance of the investiture of the gods, and then um, uh, and then Wang Wang Lingguang, the spirit official Wang, um, and he cuts off his own flesh to feed the birds. Um, <clears throat> Uh, he meets Guayan, who's uh, Avalokiteshvara, who's, uh, there's this, this again comes from Buddha's source. Oh, she's polishing the needle. Yeah. She's polishing the needle, right? Uh, this is a, you get this in Tibetan versions, the Tibetan tales too about Avalokiteshvara. Uh, the, this Holy Spirit, Heavenly Spirit gives him uh, armor. And then finally, you know, he's become sort of successful as an exorcist. So uh, he subdues the tortoise and the snake. Um, which become his emblem, uh, you know, with the tortoise and the snake underneath. And then um, he uh, defeats this um, 
uh, this kind of demonic girl, which um, if you've ever, if you've ever read uh, Vincent de Rondaste's stuff about the, uh, the, the battle of the Duke of Joe and the Peach Blossom Girl, which are these two Has parts that been of his translated into English where, or we're just talking in French? Uh, he, 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 he published a paper in English about these, kind of, they're, they're, just, they're fantastic, they're so cool. These kind of magical battles between this, this girl called the Peach Blossom Girl and the, the Duke of Joe and this kind of demonic uh, contests. And inevitably, the, the peach blossom girl always wins until Jen kind of subdues her and makes her serve the Tao. Um, so again, these kind of exorcistic narratives. Um, but then finally, at the end end of the story, Wulong Fengsheng. So he's he's buoyed up by into sagehood by these five dragons, who again kind of come to attest to his his glory. So th this is the story, the kind of core story that shows up in all of these things, where you have it's sort of this weird, and you see this in a whole bunch of uh, like this is another one from this. Completely disin this is the, the temple uh, and this is completely disintegrating place, but it can be kind of expanded and collapsed into mm -hmm. these longer and shorter versions. Um, and you also get- So uh, it's, re it's related to, <clears throat> it's related to Journey to the North, but it's not the published text that so we think it's of. A, it's a different, Journey to the North, North seems to be sort of a, I don't know. At least in the in this these villages, they didn't seem to be reading that text. Yeah, yeah. it's a similar kind of set of stories. I'm just throwing this in there because it's fun. So this is a, a very late iconography, but one of these upshots of uh, this whole story about the peach blossom girl and this kind of demonic combat is that in really late U County iconographies, you get this idea that half of his generals are women. Mm -hmm. uh, so you get this like Genu as like this leader of the demonic feminine, where you have these these women generals, uh, which show up in a couple iconographies, um, which is this. So like uh, one side. You, Paul Katz has a re recent article where he's talking about he's talking about the Hmong or the uh, the uh, uh, what's the other name for that ethnic group uh, Miao, mm -hmm. um, but they're 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 invoking Chinese deities and and there was this whole rebellion called the Leaping Rebellion where because the, they were they would become possessed and then they would jump do a whole bunch of jumping, um, and their main deity possessing deity were these seven sisters. Hmm. Who I believe come are married to the the seven um, stars of the Big Dipper. So they're the dark stars of the Big Dipper that you can't see. Hmm. So that, of course, the Big Dipper points to John Wu. So there is probably a a relationship there. You also there's this whole kind of somebody referred to it as the 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 feminization of the divine and demonic and late late imperial China. I can't remember who said that. Uh, but you, there's this whole mythos that comes out of uh, Feng Cheng Yai, the romance of the investiture of the gods about the three goddesses who fight um, Zhao Gongming. Um, so much later, I, if I'm going to scroll, we, we're going way over time here, aren't we? I'm going to scroll way down. Through all I, you know, I don't have a time limit. We could always break it into two. If, if you have to go, let me know. Uh, uh, well, can... you're, you're, I'm sure you're getting sick of talking to me. No, uh, I, this could go on and or we could do it again. I have uh, you've got so much material. This is incredible. Stuff. Infinite junk. Oh, yeah. Here we have uh inner inner alchemy charts. Um uh-huh. I saw spot. this one, yeah. Um so much later, this is a, a woodblock print from the Boxer Rebellion. Have you seen this one? Yes. Uh yeah. where you this is the defense of the, the Sijaku church. And you have these notice you have these uh these kind of women who are coming down to protect the injured boxer soldiers. Um, and it just says Hong Dong Zhao, so the uh, the the Red Lantern red shot. Lantern. What that means, um, but presumably, what at least one one theory about this is what this this is um, doing is that this has to do with this um, late entry of Feng Chen Yai into these villages. So um, uh, I have not found so Feng Yi is a Ming novel uh, but I found no evidence that anybody ever read this novel until like kind of the late 19th century in these villages at which point suddenly they start depicting it um, so it's clear that this novel kind of arrived sometime in the 19th century when when people got a hold of it and were like whoa this thing is crazy um, so long after it was written obviously but suddenly um, so in the early murals there's no trace of it and then suddenly you get these massive depictions this is, is on opera is that is that uh, mm -hmm. Naja there in the middle up, up, um, yeah, it is, isn't it? 
they're all labeled. Who's this? I don't know. Yeah, this one. there it is. This is uh, yeah. um, Yin something. Legion. Down Naja's to the Yin. right there. Who's the guy with the sword? Yeah, that's, that's Naja. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, so you get these massive uh, depictions. Here's the whole story being <clears throat> uh, told on panels up in the, in the roof beams of this opera stage. Uh, and it, in this context, it seems to be, they seem to be specifically interested in a particular episode in the, um, <clears throat> sorry, my voice is going out. I've been yelling at you for too long now. The, uh, uh, they seem to be interested in this particular episode from the, the Romance of the Investiture of the Gods, which is about these, these three goddesses. Uh, and actually interesting, so the, the, the worship of this, this, this trinity of goddesses called the Nyang Nyangs is really old in this area. I mean, it goes back to the Queen Mother of the West and this whole, it's very ancient kind of goddess, Nua, goddess mythos in North China. But um, you can actually kind of chart the history of it where, um, so, so from, at least from the start of the Ming onwards, it's about the, you know, the Taishan Yang Yang, the, uh, the, the goddess of Taishan. Um, but then at a certain point in the late 19th century, it actually gets, the identities of these goddesses actually get replaced with the figures from uh, the romance, the investiture of the gods. And it seems to be specifically connected to this episode about this ritual, uh, which is called the, 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 the Juchu Gen, the um, David, uh, David Johnson had a chapter about this, um, which is this, again, very ancient thing. It, it goes back to at least the Meng. Um, we don't know much about it, but it's this, this kind of ritual diagram, uh, which is used in kind of war magic or exorcistic magic. And you have this in the, um, uh, for instance, this, this kind of great like drama epos at the northern border of the young family generals, um, yeah. the Yajiang Jun, uh, where they, you know, it ends with them kind of learning the nine bends of the Yellow River, uh, which is this diagram. And then you, you kind of stake, you, you build this diagram using uh, lanterns uh, outside your village. And then you kind of, every, the whole village kind of walks through the nine bends of this diagram. Uh, and people still do this in a couple of villages. Um, uh, where it's this this sort of magical maze that's conceived of as as a gen as a, a military formation, um, <clears throat> and it's and it's at least in this late nineteenth century formation, uh, it's connected to this story. Obviously, it predates this story, but you have this narrative about these three women uh, who kind of use this um, uh, this. I mean, this is these are the ugliest ugliest murals oh, on the planet. There's uh, Nadja again. Um, yeah, there must be Naja down there. And then a lot of it's about uh, Zhao Gongming uh -huh. um, as well, who's uh, and again connected. So here you have the black tiger, the, 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 the Hei Hu, who's a symbol of Zhao Gongming. And then here you're, uh, they're doing the, the Huang He Da Zhen, so the, the great formation of the Yellow River, where you see they've actually depicted these kind of stakes set into the earth with lanterns on top, which is how you do this in a village ritual, where you would stake out that kind of nine bands diagram um, and then use it as this kind of exorcist moment. Um, but then it's connected to these, these women who are these kind of demonic uh, warriors uh, who, who are canonized through this story. So have you, have you seen the, if you've seen the Bagua Zhang version of this? Uh, I have not, no. So there's a martial art that they just put the nine poles in the ground and then they, they fight, you know, basically you fight the poles. Interesting. Around. Oh, cool. <laughs> I would I would love to see that. Uh yeah, presumably that stuff happened. I just yeah, I have no sources on it in the north again. Um yeah, it, it would be surprising to me if you know somebody somewhere wasn't doing, you know, martial arts connected to this somehow. But uh um yeah, I mean here it just, these are just kind of episodes from this this story, um, which give this kind of etiology of the this ritual and the um the 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 kind of tales connected to it. So, so that's one aspect of this. Th these rituals are always changing. I mean, so this, I have no, this is not a Ming thing. This seems to actually be a late Qing thing, uh -huh. um, but um, at least as it appears in murals, but then, you know, just because it appears in murals at a certain point doesn't mean that it didn't appear in some other uh, context much earlier. So um, who knows? Uh, anyway, so that's, that's general. I mean, basically it's this, uh, kind of like exorcistic thing that um, 
uh, protects the fortress in this kind of context of like military uh, collapse. Um, and then of course, Genwu would be, uh, the, the temple to Genwu, right, which is this kind of male exorcistic deity would be matched at the Southern end of the axis by a temple to Guanyin. Uh, so I just threw up a couple of those uh, pictures here where this is this uh, fort that's been sort of abandoned, but you see there's a temple, Genwu temple in the North. And then in the South, there's right by the gate, there's this little shrine, uh, which is this building here, which is a, a Ming dynasty shrine. And inside it, you have um, these kind of Buddhist narratives connect, uh, connected to uh, the Bodhisattva Guanyin. Um, so this is the uh, what's called the Wushu San the the fifty three stations of Sudana, which is this comes from the Gandavipa Sutra, uh, which is this long narrative about this little guy who's actually a kind of proto version of Naja, um, or, or his iconography feeds into Naja, where he he goes and visits these fifty three Buddhist masters and eventually uh, achieves enlightenment. Um, Oh, these are just details from this little nice Ming Dynasty thing. Um, here's, here's another version of the same story, which I don't have good photographs of because let me take pictures. Um, here's a, uh, this is from late 17th century version of the same tale. And then later on, this gets uh, another another important Guanyin story is this, um, what's called the the, the Juku. The um, in Sanskrit, it's called the Ashta Ashtagoda Tarani, the the saviorist of the eight terrors. Uh, they had this in Tibet with Tara iconographies as well, where you have um, up here you have um, Guanyin, um, uh, and then she's kind of saving people from these different terrors that can afflict them. So if you're about to get executed, all you have to do is chant the name of Guanyin, and she'll come and save you. Uh, you know, if you're um, you know falling off a cliff or, or something, or if you're getting attacked by dragons. Uh, all you have to do is chant the name of Guanyin and she'll come and say, here's the guy falling off the cliff. And there's a there's these sort of canonical list of, uh, of terrors that Guanyin will kind of shoot out her little cloud rays and save you from. Um, so that's kind of what we got in terms of um, like fortress temples, right? And in terms of this moment in the 16th century when all of this stuff is first getting founded. <laughs> Can you so um, all right? Let, let's start it again here. We'll let's cut out the bit about uh, uh, Naja Chang and, and the. Um... Okay, yeah. So um, let let's talk about that pr procession. So let's let's leave the Ming Dynasty because um, uh, we're now we're now in a broader historical sphere. Okay, so I, I like talking about starting my conversations about pro uh, processions with or uh, about processions and opera and all this stuff with a discussion of this mountain, uh, which is a mountain in the eastern part of U County. Um, and uh, this is the picture I took the first time I ever went to U County, having no idea what this was. But you see that there's this big mountain in the background. And right up on the top of the mountain, there's a little thing. Um, and the name of that mountain is Huang Huashan, which is the yellow flower mountain. Uh, so this is, um, and it's the middle of bloody nowhere. I mean, this is kind of trying to get out there. It's like, you gotta go down into these ravines. This whole place is abandoned. That Huang Huashan's the mountain way in the back there. Um, <clears throat> and this is getting close. Uh, and this is uh, climbing up the mountain. Um, and you see up at the top of the mountain, there is a temple, that little thing right there. Um, and that thing, if you get up close to it, is um, this. It's a Taoist temple on the top of a mountain. Um, and it is a temple to the Dragon Kings. Um, and so, um, and it's one of the last kind of really active like mountain shrines. And so what you realize is that um, this is this is the interior. They didn't want me, I don't have good pictures because I kind of didn't want me photographing back there. So I just took one with my phone. Uh, this is the mountain god. Um, uh, and this, I'm just having fun here. This, this is the, the dragon priest who lives up there, which I took these wacky pictures. So, <laughs> cool. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so what you realize if you um, uh, read old accounts is that, you know, so obviously North China is dry um, and you need water. And so the most important thing for any agricultural society after not getting murdered by Mongols is, as you said, drought. Um, and so everywhere there are these Dragon King temples and there used to be these incredible networks. So uh, you'd have these kind of mountain peaks that would have these temples on them. Uh, the, and this temple was connected to a whole network of other such temples on other such mountain peaks, and they all knew each other. So the, the central temple was um, actually something Hrochos was obsessed with and was never able to get there because the Japanese were fighting the mountains here. 
uh, was this this place quite near here, uh, which is still there. Um, but then it would be connected uh, both in terms of this kind of like, uh, like what's the word, sort of spiritual map of the, the mountain ranges here, but also in terms of these kind of deity processions where people to this day, you know, in the villages down below, they'll bring their statues up and put it in this temple to kind of get the, the ling, the, the numinous energy mm -hmm. of the site. Um, and then it, it, because this is kind of this very spiritual, po spiritually powerful place, which is one of the last places that still has an actual Taoist priest managing a, a, um, a Dragon King temple. And one of the things that you realize, I should have put a picture in here, I didn't, is that um, the dragons move. And this is the most important things about dragons. They fly around. Um, they're not stationary gods so unlike Genwu who sits you know he's he's depicted sitting and he's he's seated on the north of the fortress mm. and he's always there and he's surrounded by these guys who are standing the dragons are always depicted in motion and you have to ritually accommodate for their motion so um, one of the things that happens in this temple is that on a certain day every spring they open the main gates which are in the back of this opera stage uh, in this building here I should I should have put a picture in here I didn't um, and that lets the dragons out so the dragons are big and they can't fit through the side doors um, they're, they're, I, I asked them about that. I had this eight long interviews with them about what, what's going on here. So the dragons are like really large, obviously, and they, they can't fit through the little side doors of the temple, but they can fit through the main door, which is in the back of the opera stage. And so on a certain, the second day of the second month, uh, uh, so early spring, they throw open the gates of the temple and the dragons go out and then they, they go everywhere. They fly around and they bring rain. And then at a, a certain point you have to, and when the fall comes or when sort of midsummer comes, you don't want any more rain. So now you're worried about floods, you're worried about hail, you're worried about storms destroying your crops. So you have to bring the um, dragons back, you call them back and then you shut the door and kind of lock them in the temple for a couple of months so they can't go out, right? And so you have this kind of like ritual motion of the gods, both in the terms of like these kind of temple processions, which would move all over the countryside and unite these different sites. And also in the sense that the gods themselves are moving and you have to kind of control their motion and or accommodate their motion in certain ways. Um, so I like kind of um, starting with that as like kind of what we're trying to explain here, right? This, this feature of the North Chinese countryside. So going way back, so this is a, a temple from Dunhuang, which is, sorry, a, a, an image from Dunhuang. Do you know what Dunhuang is? It's like this uh, kind yes. of Buddhist, right? <laughs> uh, far West China, Tang Dynasty stuff. Um, and this is an image of Vaishravana, who's the Buddhist god of the North, uh, who's probably Vaishravana. It says here, um, uh, Shui Lu Tianwang, so the, um, so the time when the 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 heavenly god uh, rode out on the the roads of water. So this uh -huh. is this kind of god um, who seems to be Vaishravana, and he's depicted riding out from this. Um, those little cat people. Yeah. So these are his his kind of his guisa. These are his 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 shenbing, right? His his demonic soldiers. Uh, who surround him. And you see here, he's riding out down from this temple, which is depicted in the corner. He's being seen off by these two figures. Uh, and nobody knows, there's a whole mystery about who these two figures are. Uh, figures are. It's kind of a, they show up in Tibetan iconographies of the same God. And then down here, you see, these are kind of the figures of water uh, down here who are, you know, depicted in this, this kind of watery landscape. Uh, and they're these um, uh, demon soldiers. So you have- Is he holding a dragon horn there? What? The bottom one at the bottom? One on one, he might be. Which one? Yeah, it's, it's the center one has a dragon horn in his hand. Yeah, a piece of coral, right? Oh, it's a piece of coral. It might be. This guy's got like a, a pot or something. Um. Cool. And you actually, um, and this this connects to a whole bunch of narratives about um, fortresses and like tantric exorcism in the Tang Dynasty. So if you ever read the the great kind of probably the greatest Tang Dynasty tantric master was this guy called the Moga Vajra, um, Bukong. Uh, and if you read um, the biography of Moga Vajra, one of the various, I mean, he's depicted as this kind of miracle worker. I mean, it's very clear that the Chinese kind of don't really understand what Tantra is, but they're just like, this guy did magic and here's all these great magical things that he did. And one of the stories that's told about him, I love this story, is that um, uh, the, um, so it's the Tang Dynasty, uh, Let's see, let me go for, oh no, wait, what do I want here? What am I looking for? Um, let's go over to this Tibetan stuff. Uh, so this is, um, this is not my site. This is uh, himalayanart.com, which I love. Um, this is uh, 
by Shravana riding a lion. All right, so this this is the story, right? This it's the Tang Dynasty, uh, the and there's a city out in the west in the deserts in Xinjiang, which has been um, I think it's either in Xinjiang or Gansu, I can't remember. Uh, and it's been uh, the, the 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 Tibetans and the and the Sogdians have kind of laid siege to it. And so the emperor is like Amogavadra, save my city. Um, and so what Amogavadra does is he um, kind of gets this pot. Uh, and he he kind of does his magic on the pot and this cloud comes out of the pot and flies out to the west. Uh, and then you see the city of um, uh, the, um, why is this super blurry? It's unfortunate. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the city and then the city itself experiences this giant black cloud which comes down of it. There's the sound of these kind of battling demon soldiers. And when the, the cloud clears the, um, uh, you know, the, the Tibetans are defeated and the, you know, the Sogdians are driven off. And uh, because of this, the emperor orders that images of Vaishravana, who is the Buddhist god of the north, be placed in the northern gatehouse of every city in China. Think about that. Think what we've yeah. said about Denwu and the northern towers, right? Here, that's the route, right? Assuming that actually happened. I, I've never found any other reference to this other than this one story. But, uh, but it gets to a couple things where, first of all, you have... But that's a, from Dunhuang. That story is from Dunhuang itself. That story is from uh, the um, uh, the what's the Gao Sanglu, the records of the high um, high monks, uh, which gives a biography of Amogavadra. Okay, cool. Um, but these uh, this that image that I showed was from Dunhuang. Um, this one is from a, a Tibetan collection, which is this this kind of image of uh, Vaishravana kind of riding out, surrounded by his spirit soldiers. And this I love this because it's the root of a whole bunch of things. Like it's um, first of all, you have this like tantric kind of um, like pot magic. But you think uh, in our in our mythos, we have genies in bottles, uh, where we have this idea that you rub a, a lamp and this kind of cloud comes out and inside there's this magical being, which is kind of powerful, terrifying. And this mythos goes all the way back into this material where you always see these, these, uh, these kind of gods are contained in pots. And then when they come out, they come out in a cloud and then they can kind of do stuff for you. Um, <clears throat> And, right. and you'll so, see it. when the pot in well, so in Chinese in Taoist cosmology, the pot is actually a well. It's a jing, right? Mm -hmm. It's uh, and and that's that's how the the uh, uh, outlaws of the marsh or the water march and story begins, right, with the opening of a pot. Right. You have this this kind of and they come out in a cloud. Remember this? That's just this image of them, kind of all these deities, kind of bursting out in this uh, kind of terrifying yeah. cloud. Yep. Uh, here you Sorry. get this. This is a, a, a Chinese image that was gifted to Tibet in the Ming period of these deities kind of riding out amidst kind of cloud and storm, right? Um, <clears throat> this is an attendant of Vaishravana. Uh, and the um, in the tantric context, you have all these, uh, like the, the vase initiations, there's a whole class of tantric initiations where you do these, uh, you have these kind of ma magical vases that, that kind of do things, right? Um, and it, it, I think it's kind of this, shared Asian mythos about these these pots that contain these kind of cloud deities basically. So I'm just um, going to interrupt really quickly because I, I have this I have this project that it was on the martial art Xing Yi and there's a Xing Yi or so heart um, heart intent right and it's it it it, it lived in in uh, Muslim in Hui communities for a long time and supposedly they have another secret martial art called the seven vases hmm. that is used just to defeat that one art. This is, this is not for fighting other people. It's just to fight those people. Anyway, I just thought that was there. The, the, the cosmology of the vase, of course, is also like there's the jar, but the vase is also the golden elixir, right? Mm -hmm. You should talk to uh, my buddy, Alex has been uh, studying uh, with a Muslim master in, in Qinghai for two or three years. Um, uh, I think it's, it's Bagua Zhang. I forget the name of the Zhang, um, but he's um, uh, he, he's he's got this uh, Weizhou teacher, like Chinese Muslim teacher in his seventies. Who's been uh, he knows your channel. Uh, <laughs> oh my, yeah, I want to talk to him. We'll 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 we'll, we'll chat about that later. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sounds um, great. Okay, right. So in uh, so this is this this thing that kind of passes between China and Tibet, where you get these you know Chinese images which are being given to Tibetans, Tibetan images which are coming back, shared mythos. Um, and this in, in the Tibetan context, this becomes the, for instance, the iconographies of the Tibetan mountain gods. 
uh, where this is the god of the deity Machin Pomra. So the god of the deity, the, the god of the mountain, Amni Machin, whose name is Machin Pomra, uh, who's depicted here uh, kind of surrounded, you know, with this water pouring down, surrounded by his kind of riders, his retinue. Um, and in the Chinese context, um, this uh, becomes a certain genre of temple murals where you have people riding out on one wall and kind of riding back on the other wall. It, it very early on, uh, at least from the Song Dynasty, you have te textual records of this kind of circular motion through the temple rum. Um, and it's also connected to these kind of like exorcistic uh, images of um, uh, processions of, of various types. Have you ever seen these images? These are the um, the, the famous um, images of, they're called the, the Soshan Tu, the images of scouring the, uh, the mountains and, and, and uh, for demons. So you have these, these are the kind of the demonic soldiers with their hawks and bows and they're hunting down the demons of the mountains where here you can see there's this kind of female demon who's been caught by a hawk. They're very violent. I mean, they're, they're not particularly PC anymore, but uh, here are the, the tiger demons and the, the fox demons all fleeing from these, um, demonic soldiers who are who are pursuing them in these these uh kind of i don't know what to call them like what's the word uh hunts i guess and then here uh okay there should be i guess it's not in this one you, you'll usually have an image of the deity who's kind of receiving this procession of demon soldiers back and usually it's arlong um <clears throat> you also get this in the context of like jong kuei uh the, yeah, the kind of yeah. demon uh queller with this let's see let me, let me get this the right size here Procession this, of demons, yeah. Famous image of the Song Dynasty image of Zhong Kui with Oh, I yeah. Here you have, and there you have a um a, a legong there. They've got the the beak anyway. Quality of legong. Yeah, well maybe the, this guy. You mean? Yeah, yeah. They have chicken. Why do they have chickens? They I don't chicken, know. Chicken people. Um, <laughs> just like it's funny. Uh, it's to be fun. Yeah. Um. Well, that other one, I, I, you know, I, I, um, I took some images and put in my my second book from, uh, I think it's a collection in in Cleveland, that mm. is, is a, one of these processional uh, images of of rounding up demons. Mm -hmm. What did you call them? What's the name of it? The, the... Uh, they're called the the Soshan to the, uh, at least that's the name that's been given to them. Uh, the the image of of like searching the mountains. Um, but in the, they also show up in murals. So, um, and, and this is a, where it kind of hasn't been studied. Uh, so let's go down to this. Um, these are these nice early 20th century. I could do a whole history of this in like Song Dynasty murals, but it'd be boring. These are these nice uh, early 20th century Tibetan images uh, from, from Qinghai, uh, from Amdo of these kind of um, Tibetan mountain deities as Chinese gods. Um, <clears throat> but what you get here is um, this whole genre of um, kind of like what, what in modern painters will call riding out and riding back images. So, mm -hmm. or, or entering the palace and leaving the palace. So, Chu Gong, Ru Gong. So, on the, if you're facing uh, north, well, we'll do it the Chinese way. So, you're standing in the north and you're facing south. Um, then, on the left wall, uh, the gods will ride out and on the right wall, the gods will come back. And this is a super old genre. You have textual, the, the earliest extant ones are like Ming, uh, but you have textual references to it going way back. So this one uh, is um, kind of this uh, really unique one from a um, probably early Qing uh, temple that's to the fire god, but it seems to have been converted from an old, what's called the Qidao Miao, uh, a uh, uh, banner temple. So each of the um, mm -hmm. main military banners would have a temple uh, and those temples would have murals. And then uh, I think what happened to this one is that in the early Qing, it got kind of converted into a fire god temple because the old Ming banner temples were decommissioned. Uh, but what you have here is so uh, on the inner wall, you have this kind of fortress, which the god is, you see them riding out here and they've got cannons uh, and stuff like this. And then up here, the god is, um, you remember in that stella I showed you, they referred to Mo Jen, so like silently pacifying. So in this kind of realm that we can't see, the god is riding out with his his soldiers and his demon uh, assistants and kind of pacifying the people. And then out here you see these images of uh, the the Ming uh, or I don't know, possibly early Qing army kind of defeating these uh, these riders, whoever these guys are. It's not um, particularly. Uh, 
specific, but you have these kind of battle images here. They're kind of blasting them with these, what are they called, Huotong, these kind of like proto uh, guns. guns. You see, they've got these like tubes with fire coming out. Um, and then the battle is won, the god is victorious. So on the other wall, they come back. Uh, and here you see they're peaceful. So they're no longer fighting. They're just kind of riding along because the god has won. He has pacified the demons and he's now returning uh, to his, his palace, which is up here. So um, you know the line from the, the Tao Te Ching? Uh, which one? Uh, the refers to this. It's, it's like, uh, how does it go? Um, um, it's, I, 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 can't, and I can't remember what chapter it is. Otherwise, I'd look it up quickly. But it's something like, um, if, if, uh, if the Tao of the left doesn't work, go right but then come right back. There is a, a description in the Tao Te Ching of, uh, I'm also gonna forget the wording. It's like, um, you know, basically storm turning into, into peace over the course of the year. And a lot of the, um, later on when people looked at these images, a lot of it was interpreted in terms of that line from the Tao Te Ching. Hmm. where it's this you know the cyclic process I and mean, i mean they're probably not wrong i mean it's this cyclic process of like storm turning into you know typing Qingping the or uh what's it called wang Qingping the the, the 10,000 countries all at peace uh where you have this kind of cyclical image of the universe and the storm and kind of then turning into into sun um and this then becomes the Dragon Kings, right? So this is a Dragon King temple. This, I love this one. So this was built in the 16th century uh, and then in the uh, early 18th century. So in 1709, it was repainted uh, with the Dragon Kings. So this is the Mother of Waters. Um, uh, which is this kind of figure at the center, this woman. And then she's surrounded by her five sons uh, who are the five the Dragon Kings in the five directions. Uh, and then the master of waters, the, the Yusha, who's another very ancient figure who shows up in classical texts, who's kind of the, the master of rain. Oh. And then here they ride out. So this is the, the, the kind of the, the ride of the gods where they leave the crystal. You can see this, this image of the red, the red sun, the, the Hongyang, the, the, the red yang force, which is um, descending on this, this wave uh, kind of out over the, the crystal palace where the dragon mother is and then they're 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 kind of riding out in this procession where you see they're actually bearing a palanquin and you never see what's in the palanquin or some, sometimes you do but um and then they're they're dispensing rain and then down here you have all these little kind of people uh going about their business and they're kind of all running into you see there's these stampeding horses that are trying to get into the uh the the fortress in time for the storm um right all this is happening up in the clouds presumably right and you know here are these people running and then here you have this guy's getting hit by lightning there's these people Ooh. hiding in the uh and here's another bunch of people hiding in a in a cave because of the the lightning here's the guy who who makes lightning with the drums and the uh and the, the goddess of winds the dragon kings themselves and then okay they've gone out they've given wind and then they have to come back right you have the, the same oh there's the guy with the thunder ruler you just talked about uh th that's it's called the the what's it called Liang the the uh the the ruler for measuring heaven so oh. you you have to the the heaven and the seasons have to be in their correct proportion um up here you have these little guys you see these guys bearing these white tablets so these are the um the 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 segonger the the um uh, the the little spirits who hold the tablets from heaven that say the length of the different seasons so that it's all correctly regulated um, and then they come back on the other wall so then this is the 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 left so it's going in a clockwise circle so they go out on one side back on the other side and then here you see it's become peaceful uh, and the they're awaited at the crystal palace uh, the the red sun has become this sort of feminine hand who reaches down to you remember in um, the start of journey to the west yeah. Uh, one of the things that kicks off the story is that the dragon king of this particular river outside of Chang'an uh, reigns when he's not supposed to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't, he doesn't have a, a, it's called a yubiao, a, a, a rain scroll, and he's supposed to get it from the Jade Emperor. And he, due to some dumb bet with somebody, uh, he, he reigns at the wrong time and then he's beheaded. And this is one of the various things that kicks off the, the you know, um, Sanzang and his journey to the west. So here you have the the Yubiao, the the rain scroll being you know returned to the the Jade Emperor whose hand is coming down. Um, 
And then down here you have the ritual. So um, you, the harvest has been done correctly, right? The, um, so you, this is a crappy picture, but uh, you see, okay, so they're, they're here they're harvesting. They've got a big pile of grain. This is their grain thresher. Uh, they got the oxen, they're carrying the grain into their house. These, these guys with the sacks. And then the, the, the Taoist ritual begins. So you have, um, this uh, Taoist guy with a, with a mouth organ, this is Stephen Jones stuff. Um, this is again painted in 1709. You have the rest of the Taoist band where they're um, you know, playing different instruments for the Taoist music. Uh, you have the, the members of the society kind of all come to attend the ritual. Uh, here's more different parts of the, the band and the procession. Um, and then they're arriving back at an image of the temple itself. Oh. So you have this kind of recursive, and actually you see this is the tree, a picture of the tree that actually does stand outside of this temple. So you have this recursive image of the temple, and then behind the temple you have uh, the god of the mountains and the god of the earth, who are receiving these offerings and then relaying them up to the crystal palace where the gods live. I should also note, just uh, a propos of our discussion of uh, kind of vase magic. So notice that this whole procession, first of all, it's proceeding out in clouds. And second of all, it's coming from incense smoke. So um, uh, you see that she's got this incense burner on her desk. Yeah. And out of that, it's like this little pot. And out of that is coming this wisp of smoke. So you go into a temple, you burn incense. And that smoke then kind of metastatizes and turns into this cloud, which all of the deities are riding out from. So again, you get the same kind of like image of... Uh, and it was sort of like weather magic, which is connected to exorcism, which is connected to the, the kind of round of the seasons, which is connected to Taoist ritual uh, in this uh, space. These are, this is just one of the most completely gorgeous. These are the dragon kings uh, riding out uh, in all their, all their wacky glory. Um, uh, right, so to just to kind of uh, push, so this, this is the, the most common thing. I mean, this is everywhere in North China uh, and it's, it is the most, far and away the most common type of mural painting that exists in late Imperial China. Uh, and it's, there's kind of regional variations, but it's, it's basically, this is another uh, Qing Dynasty one that's now stolen. Uh, here you have the Taoist, like the kind of master of the waters imagined as a Taoist priest. This guy down here looks kind of like Sun Wukong, but I don't think he is. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, this is it now, so it's been cut off the wall and stolen. Um, uh, this is the damaged, effed up temple, which is when I visited, it's probably worse now. I saw this in 2018. Uh, here's another one that's been converted to a schoolhouse, and you have this beautiful image of the, the mother of waters and her attendants kind of uh, receiving the procession as it, as it comes back. Um, and then you get this image for other deities. So uh, this is, for instance, the three uh, goddesses that we talked about earlier where there would have been three statues, one, two, three, and they're now destroyed. But on the walls, you have this incredible procession of the goddesses uh, kind of riding out um, to, in this case, not dispense rain, but to dispense human fertility because they're fertility goddesses. Um, you have these lovely, I think these must be like somehow Tibetan inspired images with these kind of curling clouds uh, and these, these kind of warriors who, who, I think these are the, actually the gods of smallpox. Um, uh-huh, yeah. Some plague, plague demons. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another one. This is from the late uh, 17th century. Uh, same scene. Here's the mother of waters. Um, this is another one from 1730, I think. Um, so these are just everywhere. And you get these in also, this is uh, actually the procession of the, the city god, the um, Chung mm -hmm. Uh So the, the, the god of the here's his like uh, military Taoist band with the, the chimes and the, the flutes and the, um, uh, and here's this, I love this, this is written, painted in the early Qing. So you have this like, pr like I don't know what, like faux Manchu uh, written on this memorial where they're, um, uh, let me see, here's one. This is a uh, Lord Guan, so Guan, uh, Guan Yu uh, in this incredible kind of late 18th century thing. Uh, we have these, it's, it's so bunged up wow. now, but the figures are beautiful yeah. with these, um, I think probably Jesuit inspired faces with these deep wrinkles and, um, uh, so let's see, um, here's another, this is, you see there's a bunch of, so this is the, the god of the rivers, uh, the Hushan, riding out, here's the, the dragon kings, um, this is the god of the five ways, so you'd have, which is actually, uh, interestingly, one of the most common deities in North China that nobody knows about, uh, where you have these little roadside shrines to, uh, this god, who's the Wu Daoshan, the god of the five ways, um, might be, 
same thing as Zhao Gongming, but here you see he's he's riding out uh, with his kind of exorcist buddies and what they're riding towards is up here. You see this little kind of demonic scene up in the corner where uh, you can't see this super well, but this is a monkey with these kind of like willow, female willow spirits. And they're, they're being very uh, sort of like sexy and uh, like immoral. And they're, uh, they're being, you know, oppressed by this kind of uh, exorcist deity of the, of the roads. Um, the, the god of the five ways, how, say that in Chinese. Wu uh, Dao Shan. Um, uh, he, he's, um, yeah, he's really obscure, but he was once incredibly common because like every village would have a couple of these little, uh, so in the south, south you have the Tu Di Gong, the, the god of the earth. Yeah. Uh, whereas up in this area, Tu Di Gong is actually really uncommon, but uh, what you do have is the Wu Dao Shan, so the god of the, the roads. Um, who kind of is, you see these little shrines at intersections and stuff, which will have images of this guy. Um, and then what starts to happen in the 19th century is that you get, um, uh, well, actually earlier than the 19th century, you get uh, these kind of Western elements seeping into this. So here's another Dragon King procession where they're riding out uh, and you see uh, this, um, kind of like interestingly like western inspired building over here on the left yeah, yeah, yeah um and then here they're coming back and the the building has turned into a chinese style building they're you know the dragons chained up you have this again this the red sun on the water which is this kind of symbol of the the yang the yang chi and then down here you have uh this beautiful little taoist procession which is running along the bottom. So in, in you County, mostly you get pictures, what in terms of this ritual information, right? So what, what is the ritual connected with this? Mostly it's um, uh, these Taoist processions, but in other areas, you actually have depictions of different types of rituals. So um, uh, let me, we'll just go through all this junk. Let's see, what do we got down? I want to go all the way down here. Um, uh, where you have images of opera and you have images actually of martial arts. Uh -huh. um, so um, uh, this is just photos I took at, at like a temple fair where they're actually doing this. So they're processing through the whole village in this uh, uh, kind of procession led by a Taoist priest. Here's a great image of one from the uh, 18th century, this like Russian, uh, uh, this Scottish guy who traveled on a Russian mission and uh, to the to the court of Beijing and drew a picture of one of these. A little processions. What year is that? Like eight, 18th something? 18th century. I forget the exact year. Wow. Um, uh, here's the one I showed you earlier. And then here you go. So so you get these sort of interestingly ambiguous depictions where um, here's somebody giving offerings, seems to be a plate of offerings, uh, but then you have this guy who's in opera clothes. Um, so there's some sort of performance going on here. Uh, and then what this building might be a temple, might also be a stage. Is kind well, of well, you, just to make it clear, right? That the it's opera clothes, but he's a general with the with the four flags of the four directions. So it mm -hmm. represents the same essential cosmology that he's controlling, being, you know, uh, Sun Bing uh, spirit mm -hmm. soldiers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, probably. Again, I wish I had sources that like said this stuff. Th this one's fascinating because. Um, so, okay, so what you see here is, uh, okay, so here's an image of the temple, right? So they're worshiping the temple and you have these guys praying, right? And then here you have, uh, so what you would do with these ceremonies would you would have a willow switch, which is this kind of fertility symbol. So you would have, here's this guy with this willow switch. And then down here you have the sacrificial sheep, uh, which they're bringing to sacrifice at the temple. Here's guys playing music. And then here you have these people who seem to be doing some sort of, martial arts something um where um so interestingly one of the things i love about this is that over here you have this uh, image of what might be a stage at least it's some structure and then there's a table with masks on it uh. right? so they're they're trying to emphasize these are not the gods they're people with masks of the gods on this is uh david johnson's book about um spectacle and sacrifice where he's talking about these these saisha these uh kind of like mummery or like temple processions uh and then here you have these uh these guys uh who've got the masks on and they're out doing this kind of like martial arts show of some sort um and then I, this is my favorite one where you see this guy uh 
you know, just in case you thought that these were gods, here's the guy actually taking off the mask uh -huh. to reveal, to just so you're clear that these are actually just people with doing this kind of mummery. Um, but these kind of processions with masks are in Tibet too. Yeah, pretty similar. Yeah, I mean, you have similar. It's a lot more tantricized in Tibet where you have, um, you know, it's understood in terms of uh, like, these kind of um it's called cham dancing so you have these uh like tantric dances where you cham cham yeah c-h-a-m cham yeah, yeah. um uh but i think it's a similar kind of thing where you have these people who may or may not be understood to be possessed by the gods who do these kind of procession dances martial arts shows again I don't know anything about this. I mean, it's like you have these, you, you know, it's like something like this was going on. Uh, you know, David Johnson's done some work where he's found documents on some of it. Um, and here you have this picture that it's like, okay, this is depicting something like this, which means people were doing these processions. Um, and I've, I have a couple other descriptions from old books where there people are talking about, um, you know, these kind of like exorcisms that would be done in the new year, something like this may have involved martial arts we just don't know or i don't but, know but i what I, I can't remember whose book it was but there was a book that was talking about the scale of some of these rituals mm -hmm. some of these rituals might have involved a hundred thousand people i mean they some of these could be quite large and or invoke uh, you know f i think david johnson mentioned 500 different deities represented in the prep procession right so really, so the, or the entire, the entirety of all, all the gods in function Yanni, for instance, were all. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they were, they were huge and, and like, I mean, it's, it's so clear that they were doing this, but then you're like, and you find these kind of fragments of it. You're like, ah, I want to know more that, about that. But then uh, I, I haven't, I found some sources, uh, but nothing great. Um, so, so that's kind of the dragon Kings, right? Um, so you have this, this idea of this kind of, clockwise motion through the room, these gods that go out and back. Um, and then uh, the, um, um, just another thing to point out about this is that it, um, so the gods are depicted as kind of coming through the wall of the interior part of the room where you have this crystal palace um, that's back there. Uh, so let me, and then what happens with this is that interestingly enough, it gets, so somehow tied in with like Western imagery and the opera uh, in this weird way. So sort of from the late Ming, like the 16th century, same time you have these Europeans who are showing up on the South China, China coast. And one of the things that they're bringing with them is uh, prints. Um, they're bringing these kind of like, uh, what are called viewed optic uh, prints from, from Europe, uh, which show city scenes and, and use perspective. Uh, and that this turns out to be uh, really influential in China where people start copying these things, uh, depicting them, um, drawing these kind of perspectival cityscapes. And one of the ways that this, uh, these are all from different time periods, but one of the ways that this, you also have these kind of zogoscope shows where um, people will kind of look in through a, you know, it's like a peep show, you know, you look in through the, uh, the little hole and you see some some porn or some cityscape or some combination of the two um and one of the things that happens is that this kind of ends up in these temple murals where you have these again these same procession scenes that are kind of using these western cityscapes to represent the place of the gods um and this ends up kind of taking over in some way where you have uh this is this gorgeous early 18th century goddess temple uh, where you have this kind of building on the right that's being drawing from these Western Western prints uh, and then depicting this procession where she's riding out on one, this, the whole lower half of this is destroyed. Uh, she's riding out on one side and riding back on the other um, to this kind of European palace here, which is, um, and you get these uh, weird adaptations where, um, uh, for instance, you have people, you know, so you notice traditional Chinese painting never has shadows. Mm -hmm. um, and people start drawing shadows. So this is on the back wall of a Dragon King temple where you notice there's this rosary hung from the, a peg and this peg has a shadow, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly there's this like trompe l'oeil trick the eye moment when uh -huh. uh, people, you know, they kind of want this recession in space specifically for these Dragon King temples where the rear wall is thought to kind of recess into holy space. 
Uh, and, and in order to make that so, you have to depict it as this kind of trick of the eye way where it looks like these are real objects that are there. Um, this is this this is the sidewall where you have this Dragon King temple, uh, you know, Dragon King procession returning to the Crystal Palace and, and super uh, traditional format. Here's another one with the goddesses and they're kind of cooking, they're making balza. Um, and then uh, on the sidewall, you have this rose, again, this kind of rosary that's hanging and it's uh, it's kind of like, it has this shadow and it looks super, you can almost reach out and touch it, right? And this becomes this new kind of wave that sweeps through uh, art from this period and actually ends up um, kind of replacing all these traditional uh, iconographies. So uh, for this, for instance, is uh, Guan, Guan Yu, uh, but he's here is the protector of a Buddhist temple. So, um, and then this is the life of the Buddha uh, being told in like a perspectival kind of like Qing European palace. Uh, I love this one. <laughs> That's great. Uh, and, you know, that, so this is all, this is a very similar story to the Genwu story where, you, you know, he leaves his palace, the whole thing, it's all here. But it's, you see in the back, these like kind of wacky perspectival views these this weird architecture up here um actually uh you'll like this one one of the best examples of this is actually from shaolin Se, uh where it seems to be the case shaolin, that what, temple. shaolin temple yeah yeah uh what happened was at least what i've read about this i haven't kind of cried into this myself I, I didn't take this picture this is actually from their website uh where in the early uh uh, 19th century, there was a, a Qing official who came to visit the temple and they put on this big display for him. And one part of this display was painting murals. Um, so here um, you see in the, what's, what's mar marked as the Da Xiong Dian, the, the kind of main temple hall, there's this Qing official meeting with this monk. And around him, they're putting on this incredible martial arts display mm -hmm. where there's these guys fighting uh, and, you know, kind of doing tumbling. Um, I'm not sure if this is necessarily connected to the perspectivalism necessarily, but that's a great uh, example of this kind of art and the way it becomes used to depict temple space. Um, and this, it becomes connected to this kind of very lower class world of martial arts, of opera, of um, like kind of popular spectacle. Um, uh, you can probably tell me all about the, uh, here's the other wall. You can probably tell me all about what's actually going on in this. I, I wouldn't know the first. Uh, Mayor Shahar turned me on to this. Um, yeah, I was going to say Mayor Shahar's work is worth thinking about here. He, he, he does do that. You talked about Vashurana. He, he, he reviews that theory too. Uh, oh, there's a snake. Is that a snake? No? It's not a snake. Uh, yeah. yeah, well, Excuse you know. Me. Yeah, want. those are almost butterfly knives, aren't they? Like a southern style. I mean, this guy. Uh, yeah, I got these. They they actually just put these up on their website. Oh, cool. One of them. So, um, I mean, I'm interested in this because of the perspectivalism, but they're they're kind yeah. of this great record of like early 20th century martial arts performance. Or early yeah, I mean, I've seen. I've never seen this in this much detail. I've seen I've seen this image before. No. Yeah. But I haven't seen that someone take did the work. I, yeah, I, I I mean, they're obviously there, fighting. Uh, they're they're you know it's it's uh, but it's also opera. <laughs> it's impossible to tell what it is exactly. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so this ends up in stage art. Uh, this is one of the places that this goes. Where um. Uh, just scrolling way down here, uh, where you have um. Chinese opera, right? And this is everywhere in these villages where these guys are, um, you know, every village has an opera stage by the end of the, you know, basically by the end of the 19th century, you know, every single village in North China has at least one opera stage. Um, and you can actually trace in interesting ways the way they kind of um, uh, show up in these villages. And it's this huge, you know, it's like watching TV. It's this huge part of culture. Everybody's obsessed with the opera. Um, these are just some pictures I took from an opera fair of these old grannies just gambling like crazy. Uh, you know, it's a, like a total, uh, you know, county fair type environment. If you go to these things today, um, these are these amazing uh, wood blocks depicting the backstage uh, of, um, uh, of a- Look leader. at the weapons caches there they've got. Yeah. Um, these are all, I wish I had better images. What's the, what's the soup they're drinking there? What? Oh, that's a basket of masks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They have the the animal masks from this type of procession that they'd be doing. Here, you actually see them in procession, where uh, 
they're um, they're actually out uh, in front of the temple doing this kind of procession on stilts. Um, Which was a common type of procession. Mm -hmm. Have you do. seen? I I think I actually put it in my book. Yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, the they did this for the YMCA the in the YMCA camps in World War One in huh. in France. Interesting. Cool. I've seen people do it in, in modern China where they, they often cross dress. They'll dress as women and go out on like stilt processions. Uh, and they look super grumpy about it too. <laughs> <laughs> like they're uh, being paid or something. It's like, a... yeah, like someone was like, all right, guys, get your like ladies' clothes on, go out and walk around in stilts. Like, ah, fine. Um, yeah. So this is the kind of world we're talking about. And in the context of uh, these stage murals, um, so this is a stage and here, okay, so the way the Chinese stage is set up, you have the, the front stage, which is facing the audience, and then you have this backstage, and you have two doors uh, that lead in and out. So the, again, similar to a Dragon King temple where the, the deities ride out uh, from the, it's, if you're facing south, it'll be the left side. Okay, let's, let's say you're looking at the stage from this perspective. So the, the Dragon Kings uh, come out on the right wall and they go back on the left wall. Uh, in the opera, the opera players come out from this door on the right and they'll go back in through this door. So you again have this kind of um, clockwise procession through the, the stage space. Um, and the, um, these are just pictures of uh, kind of stage epigraphy where you have the graffiti. You can actually do a whole history of um, like opera in rural China from this uh, stage graffiti where you know what the troops were, you know what, what they were performing, uh, you know when they were performing it, you know when they're, where they're coming from. Sometimes you actually have these like advertisements that they draw um, where they're, they're, you know, this is them kind of advertising their true with this wonderful, again, sort of like Trump Loy, trick of the eye type thing where it's like looks like a hanging scroll that's pegged up there, but it's actually just a painting on the wall. Uh, so this, again, in the context of like theatricality and people kind of putting on clothes, you have this obsession with like, you know, like visual uh, trick of the eye type productions. Um, uh, and um, here you have them, uh, the little kind of like advertisement for the troops. So if they do a good performance, you know how to find them again and you can call them back. This is all from the uh, late 19th, early 20th century. Their, their calling card is on the back. They left their calling card on the on the back of the stage. Yeah, absolutely. It's totally that kind of thing. And they'll tell you where they're from, what they performed. Um, this is just random stuff I threw together. Uh, sometimes you can actually trace uh, like a particular opera troupe through multiple stages. So um, this, this, for instance, is the same troupe that is in right back here, this image. So you can actually kind of, and they seem to have been really active right around the end of the uh, 19th century in Yu County and specifically in the eastern part of Yu County near Huanghuashan. Uh, where the same they're called the Wenyu band and they seem to have just been terrible they're like the worst artists um but they left all this graffiti so you can actually trace them through these different stages what they were performing where um and then you get stage murals so again the stage murals are all connected to this kind of trick of the eye type stuff where you have these screens uh these kind of people pe peeking out from behind the screens these are i think are really early examples these are painted on the outer sides of the stage and they would kind of flank the performance on either side Mm -hmm. um, here again, these kind of opera performers kind of peeking out from behind the screen in this very theatrical way. Um, and then what you start getting is images of Western cities uh, on these uh, outer parts of these stages. So um, you get this kind of like fantasy architecture, which uses various forms of more crappy or less crappy uh, um, perspectivalism. Oh, there's a, there's a gate, uh, what do you call it, a temple? Uh the 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 shan man the uh temple pass the pass underneath where uh, we, yeah, yeah. wudang shan used to have one of those right i love this one because it's like actual trump of trump loy where you, you so this this plaque on the right kind of looks like it's like hanging out from the wall but it's not it's just painted that way oh well, that's cool so you can stand under it and it like looks like there's a hanging plat and you're like wait no that's just the uh uh, that's just the, it's painted to kind of uh, psych you out here. And then you have uh, these perspectival little screens on this. Carvings, uh, yeah. There's a detail of one of them. Um, that was that, that was true perspective, yeah. Uh, and then, you know, uh, often what, here, these are just pictures from inside of these really bunged up stages where you have these, you know, half destroyed images uh, with this hilarious kind of like 
quasi English writing here. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and then and then a lot of them are just these kind of pictures of this often this kind of sort of Western style palace, which seems to lead into the backstage area. So if you go through this gate, you'll get towards the inner part of the stage. And then there's these opera scenes going on outside. Where here I put this one up just because it's it's depicting some sort of uh, martial arts performance. Oh, and it's outside, yeah. You see these guys uh, up on a on a on a raised platform, like you get in the um, you know, like a what is that movie? Um, Donnie Yen. Yeah, it's a scaffolding. It's like a Hong Kong scaffolding. Yeah, and they're up there doing a martial arts battle on the scaffolding, see who can knock the other one off. Um, <clears throat> a lay this, tie. Yeah. Well, that's this, super yeah, cool. Tie. That's it. I'll have to find that one. Yeah. Oh, there's this, somebody fighting on the roof. Yeah. So this is from the story uh, about called the 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 Suang Ting, which is from a, this kind of like female warrior story where. Uh, she's the, the pavilion of gazing in the four directions where there's this girl who's kind of chasing this monkey on top of this pagoda and she falls and her lover catches her it's very dramatic so here you see this girl and she's like this kind of kung fu master so she can defeat anybody and her grandmother is also a kung fu master again this connects to this whole kind of like demonization of the feminine in this context where you have these like female warriors who are um you know either using the the nine bends method or the um they're they're kind of in these like kind of popular novels where there's these kind of female kung fu masters uh and they show up in these things where here you have her chasing around this monkey she's about to fall off the roof and then her lover like leaps out and catches her and it's very dramatic and romantic and, and you were i i read this part you 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 uh they they were definitely enacting this live mm-hmm uh, yeah, some sort of performance. I, there's records of shows in Shanghai where they do this with like early wire work, actually, uh, where they'd actually have a stage and somebody connected to a wire and they would like leap up onto the different uh, like there's a you know it's in in the book it's this different stages of this pagoda right so there's this whole dramatic scene where she's like chasing the monkey and she leaps onto the first level of the pagoda the monkey jumps up then her like grandmother tries to catch her and her grandmother jumps up and you have this like what would clearly have been this like great kind of like wire work martial arts show yeah. of them kind of leaping from level to level and then over here just for complete wackiness you have this like western style city going on these crazy kind of fantasy pagodas and stuff um, so Oh, there's so many I have so many questions or thoughts about that and one is that you know the maiden of Yu, who's uh from the the I forget how you say his name Gojian Go the story that King King Gojian this ancient story right where the term tasting bitter comes from hmm. you know that if you, if you read that Paul Cohen lays it out very beautifully that how what the real meaning of tasting bitter is about seeking revenge and that that um and 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 so so the, the story of of the, the origin an origin story of Chinese culture is uh, from this warrior woman that and that that goes way way back that's a really ancient story, um, so it, it, it also in the late Ming Dynasty you have all these female troops you have female only troops right, um, lots of them, and so. It's possible that what you see in the late Qing there is an, is some sort of you know attempt to reclaim that. That's kind of my thought anyway. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, so I, I it's very hard to know about opera in the late Ming in this area because um, there's only a couple extant stages, and I've never I've never seen any opera uh, graffiti or anything from before like 1800 or late 19th century or late 18th century of the absolute earliest right um so it seems to be that the which is not to say that they didn't do opera <laughs> it's just that the stages weren't built or that if they were built we don't have like you know the graffiti hasn't survived so it's very hard to know about anything prior to 1800 at the earliest in terms of opera um and this is one of the things i wrote about in my article where i'm saying you know um it seems to be that there was this um kind of craze for building stages starting from the late 18th century. So one of the things that actually does change in these kind of fortress villages I've been talking about is that suddenly they all start building stages. Um, and this peaks in the 19th century when you know every single village in North China gets a stage in one way or another. Um, and there's this kind of opera craze and that doesn't mean they weren't doing opera before that, but maybe they just didn't have a stage. So they would have a, like a pong, like a, a shed or something that they would set up. Well, so or like perhaps a, the opera changed, right? 
it became oh. they, they, it became a an interior space rather than an exterior space or something right it's a thought uh i i i, I was, there was just something on the, that was running through my head that I wanted to mention too, because we, we were talking about Shaolin and, and just that time sequence. So Mayor Shahar says the first mention of the term Chuen or fist, mm. right, is, is referring to drunken immortals, mm. uh, Xian Qian. The, the drunken immortals fist is the first thing he could find. And it's, it, it's about 1525. Hmm. Right. The first mention of a fist, a system of fist, whatever we call that. Right. Um, and of course, this is the period when this journey to the East story was one, probably one of the first epics written. And it was based on some kind of Taoist theatrical troops traveling around, telling the stories of immortals, probably drunken immortals as well. Um, and then, you know, uh, he, it's, it seems pretty clear that the whole, the staff is connected to the monkey, mm -hmm. the staff being sort of the central thing of Shaolin Temple as well. Um, and, and also a very popular story earlier than that, even earlier than the. There's this amazing stuff about Bhadrapani, which, uh, you know, his argument that Bhadrapani is this kind of proto-tantric God who protects the Buddha. Um, I mean, you, you've been talking, we could go off on a whole rant, but I actually, I actually got to go. I got to go. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. We just started getting into it. <laughs> Sorry about that, man. You got me excited. You're just like talking about whatever. I'm like, all right. Uh, no, that was fantastic. And let, let, yeah, let's end this. Um, uh, but I think we maybe have another talk, but we should try to figure out what it is so that we can have it more focused. Um, it's really been a great pleasure talking to you and, and, and seeing your work. And uh, I mean, this is, yeah, uh, this is the future. This is so encouraging that this kind of work is being done. Uh, well, I don't know if it'll, you know, I did this in 2018. Who knows if this will uh, become possible again, basically. You're worried that it won't be. I don't know. I, I wonder, I mean, I kind of, was in a generation where you know you could just go to china and kind of bugger off into the countryside and see what happened and uh it's certainly not the case in early 2021 you know let's let's see if that uh yeah happens again i mean i'm i'm a as i said i'm a by trade a tibetologist so i have a keen eye for the nasty stuff that's going on in western china right now uh, -huh. uh with the uyghurs and the tibetans and everything else so yeah, uh, I wouldn't go back to China under the present conditions. And... Yeah, me neither. Um, well, so this I really just want to talk to you more. <clears throat> we should have a and maybe an informal conversation too, because I think <laughs> I just I kind of like to see what happens if we completely ramble where we end up. But um, yeah, let's end it here. And I just thank you so much. Really deeply appreciate this wonderful talk. Um, here I should, I should end the, I should end it so we can see our faces at the very end. <laughs> my, my face is not as pretty as those pictures. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, it's in the eye of the beholder. Um, uh, is there any last thing you want to say on the way out? Uh, not really. Uh, th thank you, guys. If anybody, I'd, I'd be absolutely shocked, shocked if anybody has now listened to the full three hours of this. But if you did, thank you. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Fun. No, people are going to listen. People are going to be. People are going to be. Uh, people are going to be interested. I I guarantee it. Um, <laughs> I will make them interested. I'll write something that will make them interested. How about that? Uh, oh. yeah, you, you can try. I've been trying for years. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, th thank you for inviting me to talk. I'm, I'm sorry for rambling about my favorite topics. Hey, um, the, I, I think that this is a model for, for going deep because there's just no way. I mean, this is just to, 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 you know, to go deep. You have to do the beginning, even if it is a little slow getting in. You really do need 
that to develop that. Otherwise, it's like, where did this come from? Right. <laughs> well, I'm trying to, uh, I mean, okay, my, my hope with all that was, well, the reason why I started with the deep dive on like fortresses uh, was because I think it gets to the root of what you're interested in. Uh, yeah. And that at a certain, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you've seen you writing about Jen Wu and Ji Qi Guang and all these people. And there, I, I think the thing that I showed you right at the start, those two graphs, right? That proves that something happened. And we don't know what it is, but it's like that graph is like statistical evidence that these, um, these this kind of broader field of like Ming military thinking, uh, which was often population thinking, which was often defensive thinking, which was often uh, kind of um, uh, like, I don't know what, uh, yeah, that, that kind of broader world of people like Ji Qi Guang or Yin Gang or the people I'm interested in, that resulted in the creation of a religious landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can actually, this is this one, I mean, you know, I'm reading Mark Muhlenbeld's stuff and he's, he's, he's kind of searching for these little details where you can somehow prove this. And I'm thinking, okay, here's this one place, this one county where you can prove that statistically. Like you can, you can figure out what was in every village and say, okay, here statistically something happened where there was this change in defensive structures. There was this kind of militarization of society connected to the ideas of these people like Ji Qi Guang who were going to the North and the South. And you have the things they wrote and you have the, you can prove what was built when. And then that catalyzed a religious change or possibly was catalyzed by a religious change because you know when these temples were built and you know what was in the temples and it was the, connected to these kind of exorcistic deities, um, Jen Wu, this whole thing. And you can, this one point where you can actually prove that in this really rigorous way. And that's that's why I brought that out at the start, because I think that in, in all my rambling about perspectivalism and all this junk that nobody cares about, that that that's that's what connects, right? That 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 proof, which is obscure in a lot of details, and you have to talk about photo terrors and like charts and who right, all this junk, that that's what you get out of it. Yeah. That was fantastic. By the way, I this is, this is my favorite interview so far. Oh, thank you. So. I, I really I'd love to hear more about your stuff. So let, let's talk. <laughs> okay. Bye. Yeah. Cool. Thank, <laughs> thank you so you. much. Hey, if you like that video, don't forget to subscribe and watch the other ones. Also, check out my book, Tai Chi Bagua Zhang and the Golden Elixir: Internal Martial Arts Before the Boxer Uprising. And you can also find me at northstarmartialarts.com. Thanks.